All right, good evening, everyone. Let's go ahead and, and call this meeting to order. Uh, the public is reminded that if they wish to speak, uh, they need to complete a speaker form found out in the lobby, and, lobby, and you can turn it into Kim. And uh, comments will take place during the community comment portion of our agenda. Uh, introduce real quick folks up at the table with me. Uh, to my right, uh, Superintendent Degner, uh, Directors Pilcher Hayek, East Ham and Williams. To my left, Vice President Malone, uh, Directors Clausen and Finch, and Secretary Kim Colden. Um, before we get into our agenda, I would like to take a moment to recognize some people uh, our district family has lost recently. Uh, Lily Ernst was a 2020 graduate of West High and was attending the University of Northern Iowa. Um, Wageyu Wu Ferris was a member of the City High staff for many years. They will both be missed tremendously and our thoughts and hearts are with their families and friends as they deal with the grief of their loss. Uh, please join me in a moment of silence to remember them both. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'd like to offer my personal sympathies to a couple of my board colleagues who are also uh, dealing with grief at the loss of family members at this time as well. With that, sorry Brady, I'm going <laughs> to move into our agenda and first up is our ICEA update. All right. Uh, thanks, President Isone. Uh, Director, Superintendent uh, Degner, I'd like to start, um, you know, we're on the eve of I think one of the, um, our favorite days of the of the academic year when we enter or welcome our new educators tomorrow and so I'd just like to say thanks to the district for the partnership that we have with uh, with you as the Iowa City Education Association so we'll host the best uh, breakfast and then uh, I'll be able to uh, speak with them a little bit so it's uh, really appreciated uh, appreciated uh, once again and we're also on the the cusp of another academic year so I want to do some thank yous because uh, I think as teachers and paraeducators and you know, we walk in and you know, things are just ready to go, and that takes a tremendous amount of work uh, behind the scenes. So, uh, Jeff, um, to you and all the folks in facilities, please, you know, extend my thank you on behalf of the association to everyone that uh, is there. And Adam, same, you know, I just, the amount of work that goes into getting our rooms ready uh, to go and our systems ready to go is just uh, tremendous. Nick and Lindsay and Chris and uh, Carrie and Eric and HR, Alas, and the team in the business office, all of the different things with contracts and all of the inner workings. I know that that takes a tremendous amount of work as well. And I know Allison, who I don't see here, just getting everything ready for nutrition. And then Kristen on our community en engagement. I've really enjoyed partnering with you. So my yearly promise to Jeff is that we will try our best to make, because it looks spectacular right now. We're going to at least give it until the 23rd. We're going to keep it looking good. And the kids come and all bets are off, man. So we'll do our best till the 23rd. And then Adam, we will try not to break anything I'm going to get like till the 18th, so <laughs> yeah, but, but thanks. We're excited for the year to start and, um, you know, excited to be partners in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Brady. So we, that takes us to community comment. Uh, just a reminder to folks that you will have uh, four minutes to speak and there'll be a timer up on the screen. Uh, first up, uh, Phil Hemingway. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here tonight. Um, I'm going to speak about two things tonight, uh, Hills and about FFA, uh, Career and Tech Education. Um, as, as a fellow board member, I know what it's like to sit up there in the chairs and look out in the audience and hope that we're making the best decisions for the community and our students and our staff. Um, and uh, I'm not one to speak about conformity either. Uh, taking many individual positions uh, with the group, but uh, when the group makes a decision, uh, you all need to come together and recognize that uh, we want you all to be independent thinkers and we want you to raise concerns uh, and those things, but we have to be careful when we do so. Uh, we can't uh, jeopardize the trust that we try to build with the community and uh, Hills is a community that has suffered for decades on the edge of elimination. Uh, there has been many discussions about it in the past. In fact, my first um, forum uh, running for school board was at Hills, and that was the basis of the dis discussion. Uh, was the, we, the, kid, the district going to be in the long-term 
uh, interest of Hills. And uh, the Iowa City Community School District has a long-standing relationship with the Hills community. Hills Bank has done so much for our district um, over the years. Um, it, uh, uh, I grew up between Morris and Oasis, so Hills has always been a big town to me. Um, and uh, we, we need to stand by our commitment to it. Um, all, of, all of us that served together, Sean, JP, Ruthina, uh, had a meeting at Hills. It was, I believe it was recorded. I was trying to see if we could get a copy of it, but to, with the city council and everything. And at that discussion, no one voiced any uh, thoughts of closing it down. It was either renovating and, or going bigger and better. And, and I think from what I've heard uh, in the discussions, and I think at that time too, Duane was pushing for, you know, just building a new school. And I think that that's in the long-term interest of the community and that's in the long-term interest of the district. And uh, I, uh, I would just urge you all to uh, voice your concerns, but when it's, the decision is made to go forward and to, to all be behind it and, and to push for uh, the best facility we can we can put there for that community. It de it deserves it. Um, the state fair is starting. I would encourage you all, uh, if you have an opportunity, to go out there uh, and look at the FFA exhibits. Uh, they are a tremendous example of what happens when we give students the opportunity to explore uh, their skills and expertise that they don't even know they possess. And some of the restored uh, vintage tractors that they have out there and welding projects and art projects and woodworking projects are just uh, amazing that uh, these are created by high school students. And I also want to remind you that uh, in FFA, 80% uh, of the students don't come from uh, farm backgrounds or live on a farm. Yeah, they're mainly urban students. And uh, when we look at the growth and expansion with Prairie's program up in uh, Cedar Rapids, that we, we have to look at, our students would benefit from this. So I urge you to look at that. Also the uh, home building program, uh, great job for getting that uh, coming. And also to remind you when the students build the next home, it will be the 40th and it's cause for celebration. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. All right, next up, Eric and Pardon me if I mispronounce your last name. Is it Hunter Doss? I'll let you come tell me how I butchered it. It was really close. Hunter Doss. Yeah, it's thank a you. tough one. It's, uh, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Eric Hunter Doss. I uh, am a resident of Hills. I am actually a former uh, Iowa City Community School District uh, employee. I see a lot of my uh, colleagues in the room here. Uh, I don't know why I'm torturing myself, putting myself up here. I love speaking to students, adults, not as much, but I'll, I'll, go, th I'll go through with it. Um, I admire you for um, the work that you do as board members. It is not an enviable job, especially in the past three years. You have a lot of difficult decisions that you have to make um, and a lot of factors that you have to consider when you make those decisions. Uh, my wife and I chose Hills because we wanted a small community, uh, but we wanted to be close to Iowa City as she's a nurse and she works at the university and I obviously worked in the Iowa City School District. Um, we love Hills. It's a wonderful community. It's small, it's tight knit, um, but we saw that it was a, a growing place and a place where we could really put down some roots. Um, when I think about the possibility of having a new school in Hills, I get really excited about it. Um, I look at our current school. Um, it's a great school. The staff members that are there are amazing. It's impressive what they have done down there. And when you look at the outside of a building, um, aesthetics are a big piece of what draws people to a community. And unfortunately, when I look at Hills, despite um, the wonderful contributions that have been made so far to build improvements, it doesn't necessarily draw people into the community. When I think about building a new school, 
such as what we've seen in Liberty at Liberty High School or Alexander, you see development around new schools that are built. And I truly believe that the expansion that's going to come in the southern part of Iowa City is going to continue to expand further south. And Hills is growing as well. If you have had the chance to go down there, um, you know that uh, just kind of northeast of that Casey's, um, you see a lot of houses and um, townhomes that are being built. So I urge you not to necessarily look at just the numbers as they are currently, but what they may be 10 or 15 years down the road. That's truly what leaders do. They don't just look at what's happening right now, but let's look at down the road what may be happening. And I implore you to um, really, really consider um, and think, think hard about um, placing that new school down in Hills. I think um, that there will be some positive things to come with that. So. Thank you very much. I appreciate your, your time, and I'll give you one minute back. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, next up, Joan Vandenberg. Uh, good evening, and thanks again for your time. Um, I'm here tonight uh, to thank you. Um, I, I feel like I was heard last time, and so were, most importantly, our Latino families. Um, so I was happy to see that you put the 21st Century Schools program on the agenda for discussion. I'll look forward to hearing more about what your reaction is to the positive outcomes and potential partners um, in that program. Um, but also, I really want to give a big shout out to Director Hayek because she came out to Cole um, Mobile Home Park last night and we had probably about 20 parents and it was a beautiful thing to see, and I feel like she walked the walk of equity and inclusion and had a great discussion with parents, although I didn't understand much of it because <laughs> it was all in Spanish. So thank you. Um, thank you for that. And finally, this isn't really even something that I normally talk about. I would really encourage the board as you're thinking about Hills to think about a dual language program at Magnet School in Hills. I think that was something the parents um, mentioned last night and I just think it would be a win-win. As a parent, I would have loved to have the opportunity for my kid to be bilingual leaving elementary school. Um, and I think the parents feel like that's a way to maintain their culture and language and um, you know, an opportunity. So anyway. It would be a win-win. So anyway, thanks again for your service. Um, and maybe next time I'll leave you alone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. That was our last speaker. So we can move on into our agenda. And first up is our agenda approval. I and move that we approve tonight's agenda. Second. All right, Kim. Online voting is open. Oh, I mean, I, sorry. Thank you. Logging in wouldn't be. Good. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. All right, thank you, Kim. Uh, next up is our consent agenda. And as always, uh, are there, were there any questions that directors wanted to highlight uh, as they were reviewing the bills? All right, are there any items that directors would like to pull? Yes, uh, President Eystone, I would like to pull number four, the personnel item. Number 12, talking points agreement, and number 13, the stadium rental agreement. All right. Anything else from other directors? All right. I would entertain a motion for consent minus items 4, 12, and 13. So moved. Second. All right. Kim? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. All right, thank you. Uh, items that we pulled. First up, uh, number four, our personnel. Thank you. Um, 
I had some questions and just reviewing the uh, item and I reached out to Nick Proud, our Chief Human Resource Officer, um, just to get an understanding. There wasn't anything in particular on the agenda I had a question about more broadly, uh, just reading about some of the struggles other districts are having in filling positions. I wanted some more feedback from Nick on what does our scope look like right now? Are we ready to start in less than two weeks? Yeah, yeah thank you for the question. I think um, th we're in, thankfully, a much better shape than some of our colleagues across the state because of uh, just where we're at staffing. We have a few positions that are sitting out there, but nothing that is causing us great angst. Uh, if anyone knows French, we are looking for a French teacher still, so if anyone has that while we're talking, I mean, I think there's some little pieces here and there, but that's typical going into any school year. So we're excited about that, and a lot of that is due to the efforts we made and decisions we made related to uh, how we spent semester funding in regards to reducing class size then, some early hiring, recruiting, and just continuing to prioritize these hiring practices so we can stay a little bit ahead of the curve. And also, thankfully, and you know, Brady kind of spoke to this earlier, I, I think this is a place where people enjoy working and have a supportive environment, and we want to continue to have that be a part of this. So we think that also helps us in this. So we're overall in a much better place than probably some of the things, the reports you're seeing. One of our principals uh, reported back from SAI saying there's some school districts and some really challenging times up ahead. Uh, we still have some. And there's some things that we want to be working on, and we'll be doing that during December and later all. Um, but from a teaching perspective, we're in good shape. We can still use some paraprofessionals, nutrition support, um, probably some other support services, and those are some things that we're continuing to think about how we can reach out to our community and around to fill those positions as well. Thank you. I, I think that's important for um, us as a community to be aware of that we are fortunate to have some really great teachers and staff filling those positions and preparing to greet the kids on the very first day. So that's the only question I had regarding that. I'd add just one more point because I never miss an opportunity to talk about our Grow Your Own program, but I just want to thank again the board for your support. Um, the shortage that we see across the state is why these types of programs are so important. And so while our first cohort is only in its first year and so it's two years away, we need to continue this work because the shortage is not going away. It's only going to get more severe. And so just thank you again for your support of our Grow Your Own efforts, both for our support staff and for our students, because it will be a critical piece of how we staff our buildings in years to come. The, the shortage is very real. Um, in my hometown, the Catholic school that's been in existence for years and years had to close its doors be, wow. for lack of teachers. Mm -hmm. So thank you for highlighting that. Yeah. That's a good highlight. Any other comments on this one? Right, I'd entertain a motion. I move that we approve item number four, the personnel agreement. Second. All right, Kim. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. All right, thank you. Uh, item number 12, the talking points agreement. And that's me again. Um, I just thought the talking point um, item sounds like a great way to decrease the language barrier between the district teachers and families. Um, that was even highlighted at our last meeting where we had parents come in and talk and Thankfully, Director um, Pilcher Hyatt understood most of what was being said in Spanish, and so I'm grateful to have someone up here that can understand that in real time. Um, but my question was mainly around how do we communicate with our families and staff that this service is available and will be used? And I did get an answer, but I'm not sure who shared it if they want to. Share it yeah. now. So we'll, we'll allow Kristen to kind of highlight this work because she's been leading that uh, for us. But I would just say in general, the next two we're excited to talk to you guys about and think there's some good advancements for the, uh, for the district as a whole, just like the previous one that Nick shared about uh, being positive for us. And so uh, Kristen will talk a little bit about talking points and your uh, language barrier points, uh, a good one. But there's, there's also a whole host of things that we're excited about uh, for this and, and the reasons behind it. So Kristen, go ahead. Yeah. Good evening. Thanks, Ruthina, for the question. Uh, 
Yes, when we were looking for a tool, we have a committee that has been evaluating this over the last several months, and, and that was the main reason, right? The number one reason we were looking at that is, is how to reach families who, where English is not their, their primary language and that communication between fam, uh, excuse me, teachers and families and, um, and researching many tools that are out there, talking points re, uh, rose to the top for us. And we really looked at it in two, in two, for two main perspectives. One, how can we reach families that we have traditionally maybe failed to reach with our, our traditional communication methods? And um, the beauty of talking points is it's integrated with our uh, student information system, so it's integrated with Infinite Campus, and the parents' primary language is, is imported into um, talking points. And so families who, say, choose, you know, speak Spanish um, and prefer to speak, receive communication in Spanish will receive those messages from their teacher in Spanish. They can even listen to messages be read to them as an option as well. They respond in Spanish as well. The teacher receives it in English. So um, we felt, really felt like it was an inclusive tool, you know, where we could really reach um, all families. The other half of it is really providing that layer of perfect protection for our staff so that staff aren't having to share their personal cell phones, uh, cell phone numbers or personal phone numbers with um, families or students or anything like that, so. Thank you. Yeah. Something that came up last night was that um, parents that thought they had indicated their preferred language, they pulled um, um, letters from the district out and showed me they're still getting them in English. So I don't know if this is part of that system, but I, um, but I know that it's a huge concern that they will, I mean, it's clear that they, they don't speak any English, the people that I was talking to last night. And um, it's obvious that they don't. Um, and so then when they begin a uh, process, for example, indicating they speak Spanish, and then the response, the, f the official response comes back in English, that's, it, I mean, it, it doesn't work. Right, right. So, and during the registration process, there is a specific yeah. question that asks that, and it, it does not default to English, so it, you, it's, it's a forced answer, and it doesn't default to English, um, but we know that, that oftentimes that might still be a difficult process, right? And so that's where, and I don't wanna speak over Laura's team here, and if you jump in if you'd like, but I know our student and family advocates do a lot of work to make sure that that is um, answered appropriately um, and designated appropriately in Infinite Campus because we do use that information. We'll, we'll not only use it for talking points, um, when we begin using that system, but we use it in Blackboard, which is our mass notification system that's used that I use when pushing out you know messages across the district, and we push them out in our in our top five languages based on those designations in Infinite Campus. So it is really critical that that information is accurate, and we really have multiple teams of people who, who try to work with our families to make sure that is the case. So, and Laura, I, I don't want to step on your toes if you'd like to add. I think you hit the key points when our learning supports department assumed the responsibilities for language services just this past school year. Um, we just dug in and began to kind of get a baseline information of what services were, had been being provided. And one of the things that, um, you know, we've got kind of a two, three year plan of the areas that we really wanted to focus on and getting a tool that Kristen just described really well for talking points has been really kind of a year or even more in the making um, to get to that point. So that was one of our accomplishments to get there. Um, we also pull information um, seasonally for the schools to make sure that they are aware and looking at the um, language, preferred language um, requests that you know, you're talking about that they do in PowerSchool and um, have upgraded the level of um, the use of language line. Um, we've upgraded and changed some of our contracts um, with some of the service providers that provide either translation or interpretation. We've also um, kind of revetted the district interpreter process, making sure that the proficiency levels are there for um, them to be able to um, provide you know, quality interpretation and translations. And um, Karine Frank, who's right next to me, our learning sports coordinator, and Crystal Josel, who's I think right back there too. Um, there are a couple key team members that have been working to kind of 
um, get that baseline and see areas that we need to continue to improve in in language services. So if it's something that we could use an update on in the future, we'd be happy to provide kind of where we're at and then some areas that we're continuing to work on and improve. So we really appreciate the awareness and um, bringing up that it is a process that um, it's an issue of compliance as well as, you know, we want to move way beyond compliance and, and be committed to making sure our families are receiving communication in the language that they prefer. Any other comments on that? Uh, well, actually, just more on the safety issue. Um, I, I know that it's going to be optional this first trial year. Um, and then after that, our, it will, will we look to it being mandatory? And the reason that I'm asking is uh, a lot of, I know a lot of the communication between coaches and, and players happens on social media or through texting. And you know, I had, I had mentioned to Superintendent Bigner um, earlier this week that, um, for instance, my, my kid's soccer club has a policy that all communication is only through email. Um, and a second adult is always CC'd, whether that be a, um, uh, an assistant coach and or the parents on every communication that goes out to the students. So are we um, evolving into something like that? Um, can you speak to that? So you're exactly right. And that's, that's um, you know, the example that you just provided is one that we've talked about a lot, right? And so this, this uh, product would extend to coaches as well, right? There's an unlim any number of, or, any of our staff are able to use this product, right, or use this tool. And you're right, there is a layer of protection that we want to provide for our coaches, for our staff, so that they aren't sharing personal cell phone or personal phone information with students, with staff. And, and this tool will allow that, right? And then in addition to that, um, we have begun and we're working with a team of people on developing you know, best practices or acceptable use um, for communication guidelines that include exactly what you're talking about. So it's larger than just talking points, but it's use of social media, use of you know, uh, individual phones, email, all of those tools. So that's something that we've got drafted and are gonna refine over the year with input from folks as they're using the tool as well, even though it is a little bit larger than that. And if you wanna touch, you've been, and Chase has been working um, heavily with us on that part of it. And, and Jane, you're right, it, it's a progression, and so there are a number of tools that we use that are <laughs> similar in some of their protections, like Talking Points, and we know that teachers use them, like Class Dojo is, is an example. And so we wanted to implement it slowly over a year to work out the kinks and see what some of the concerns were before we said you have to stop using everything and, and use this. And we're not even sure what, that we're there yet, but it's really to your point of making sure we provide the most protections we can for our <laughs> students as well as our staff as well. Um, uh, you know, they have the best of intentions, but sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And the more that we can be clear in terms of what expectations are and what those channels um, are, that, what those channels they should utilize, whether it's for extracurriculars or in the class, I think the better we protect and serve our students and our staff members. So. The timing of when this came out with talking points at this point in the summer and understanding that teachers already have tools in place that they utilize for mass communication, we felt like we needed to um, you know, teach and get feedback and continue to develop that, but also at the same time send messages about the importance of the way you talked about communicating before making the decisions about this is what's specifically going to be accessible and this is what's not. But you're on the right track and, and that's where we're headed. Great, thanks. Yeah, last little one I'll add in there. So they talked about language access, obviously, the, the protection, and then they were kind of touching on it there at the end, but just the amount of tools that, you know, just as we think about even our parents or our kids have to navigate uh, with communication coming in. And so that's part of what we want to learn this year, too, is uh, we do want to respect the work that people have, you know, put into finding those different tools and using them and communication mechanisms they figured out. But we also need to try to help our parents and our kids streamline you know, how we're communicating to them and in what mechanism, because they're getting communication from all over the place. And so um, that, that would, I would say, is a, another benefit to it. But hopefully we addressed your questions there. Thanks. Is this something that we should take a look at at P&G? 
I'm not sure if we need a, a if we'd have a policy recommendation yet, but uh, when we do, I think it probably would be appropriate there when we look at technology use expectations for staff and for students. Um, I think right now it's in that feedback loop, but then if we would get to the policy perspective where we'd want you know, basically some compliance from staff or from kids about this is how we're communicating, that would make sense to root in policy at that point, Jane. Thanks. If I may, I have one last comment about talking points that I think um, the universal design, thinking about using a tool that is going to be effective and work for all families, which is what the talking points tool will do, but we intentionally sought out a tool that would specifically work for some of our most vulnerable populations. So the more we can do that, we're, ta we're intentionally trying to serve um, and make it a bit smoother for some of our families and the barriers that they experience, but it's a tool that works for all families. So it's sort of like reverse planning. Let's find something that works for our more structurally disadvantaged families and then it's also gonna work for all. So whether we're talking talking points or something else, that's just a way to kind of remember what we're trying to achieve. All right, uh, my head went in the, kind of the same place. James went at the end there, because I know we were gonna talk about, have our P&G update where we talk about uh, students' use of devices, and it kind of dovetails nicely into that. And um, to piggyback off uh, Director Pilcher Hayek's comment, you know, the multiple tools and different people doing different things. I think that's when we're not using something with fidelity is where you end up with gaps where people are getting stuff in English when they've asked for it in Spanish, right? So I think narrowing that focus is definitely a, the right way to go. I think. Any other comments from directors on this topic? All right, I would entertain a motion. I move that we approve item number 12, talking points agreement. Second. All right, Kim. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. All right, thank you. And last pulled item number 13. I, I pulled that mainly because um, a couple of us directors had questions regarding um, the contract, who is going to cover the cost of it, and to give district administration more time to really highlight this, because this is something new, and just reading social media buzz, and even hearing from my former ICC student and city kid is kind of excited about going. So I'll turn it over to you, Chase, yeah. maybe? I'll start and then give it to okay. Chase, but I would just reiterate that we are super excited about this. Uh, the team's been putting in a, a lot of time to figure out the details of this work, uh, but we're thankful. Yes, there's some fees you know, coming from the district to, to make this happen that Chase will walk through, but it did take the collaboration of the University of Iowa to even pull that off, knowing how much um, activity happens in that space for football season and a willingness to want to do that and provide that experience to kids. And I, I think what Ruthina was saying is that's what we're really excited about, just the experience that we provide for students. You know, We always want everybody to be part of something great, and I think this is a great activity for them to be a part of. We're hopeful to have our other um, high school participate that in, in that next year. Um, and so we'll try to rotate this through. We're not sure if it always stay in just Iowa City or if it'll need to rotate through um, some other local districts as well. But uh, we do plan to make sure that all of our high schools get included and eventually this is just the date that happened to work. So with that, I'll let Chase take it away. Great, thanks Matt and absolutely Ruthina. And uh, if you have not marked your calendar for August 26th, please do for the first annual clash at Kinnick. We are very excited about it. And um, I'll just reiterate some of the things that, that Matt said to start with, but then maybe get into some of the questions is uh, through some extensive conversations that led to a great partnership with University of Iowa Athletics. They have agreed to let us play a high school football game at Kinnick Stadium for the first time since the 70s. And I believe it's only the third time that a game has ever been played at Kinnick. And so we are extremely um, proud to have this opportunity and thankful for that partnership with the university. Ruthina, you mentioned social media. Uh, if you don't, uh, John Bacon is a great follow on this topic as he is uh, very excited. He said their promotional video, this was last Tuesday, had already gotten something like 89,000 views. Um, I think he's been putting out there, Nick told me that his uh, goal is to have 15,000 people at the stadium on the 26th, which should be 
awesome to see not only our football teams, but a lot of our students who are engaged in activities get to uh, perform and put their craft on display for our community because it's more than just about football and it's more than just about varsity is we have the opportunity to showcase our sophomore teams from both City and Liberty as well as our varsity squads along with our marching bands and our cheerleaders and our dance teams. And so there is a number of our students that, that are gonna have the opportunity to perform at Kinnick Stadium, which is a dream for a lot of them. And so uh, we, are, we are very happy for that. Um, as uh, Matt kind of alluded to, I think the only thing that would make it better is if we got to play two games there this year, but um, we only get to play one. And with three high schools, uh, we are very hopeful and with an eye to the future that next year um, West would have an opportunity to play in this. And, and we didn't go into this as a one-time thing, but are trying to put our best foot forward with collaboration to the university so they see the value in it as well because we want to rotate through our schools. And as Matt also said, um, you know, invite some other schools in the community maybe to partake as we would like to keep it in the family but you know we need competition too so um, again mark your calendars for august 26th as matt said we are working through some of the logistics and on tonight's agenda is the rental contract for um, kinnick stadium this is the agreement that we have from the university right now and that is only the rental fee for the stadium which they can put out beforehand because it's a set cost there are some other costs such as um, their security, the university police, and other things that are kind of going to be based on the event itself. And so they've given us some estimates, but we don't have those final figures yet. And so we don't want to mislead the board or the community that while the rental fee is $5,000, we expect, and we've known this since the beginning, that really the evening will cost about $25,000. Um, initially, what we've decided is that uh, before the game is played, that this would be kind of a three-way split. Um, the schools would each uh, fund a third of that along Along with the district although we also talked about that if John Bacon's you know uh, media uh, barrage works and we have 15,000 people there with adult tickets being $10 and our student tickets being $5 we'll revisit where that cost would come from because we would most likely be able to cover that with with the gate fee itself um, speaking of tickets I did mention adults $10 students five but we will honor our student activities passes because we want to make sure that students that have uh, bought those activities passes have the opportunity to attend the game so that's a very kind of just high level overview um, we were working on it just this week we continue to put out more information or um, put together more information including an FAQ that we're going to put out so that uh, we can make sure that everybody has the information they need and that everybody has a great time on the 26th so questions from the board. I would just say if West High were playing and, you know, in Liberty and my kids don't go there, I'd still go to this game. I think it's, and I don't even care what sport it is. This is going to sound like green eggs and ham. Um, but I would go regardless because I think it's good marketing for, for our district. I don't think we need to invite anybody else either. I think we can just rotate <laughs> among the high schools. But anyway, I, I see it as an opportunity for good marketing and for community building. It doesn't matter to me what sport it is. If, if it were a different thing, it's just Kinnick is a football stadium, right? So I mean, and we live in a context. So I'm excited about it. I do wanna know, obviously, about those costs as they come in. It's something we have to keep our eye on, but it sounds like you are. Thanks. It'd be weird to see a basketball game at it Kinnick. Would. It really would. <laughs> it would. It would. I hate to be an old fuddy-duddy about this, but uh, I'm looking at paragraph three of the rental fee agreement, uh, Chase. <clears throat> and the third paragraph in that uh, section starts out by additional expenses may include, and it goes on from there mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. So my concern right now is that, do we really have an idea that these additional expenses are gonna be covered by the ticket sales? We do, Charlie. They actually sent us a, um, a kind of a spreadsheet with their best estimates and the different categories that they use. And so we have no reason to think that um, they won't know what those costs are going to be given the events that they ran there or the categories would be different. I mentioned security and the um, Iowa University of Iowa police, but, you know, first aid in the ambulance service, um, custodial post event and then um, some administrative fees that they've built in and so we we're pretty confident that this will be an accurate reflection It's actually a number they kind of told us even from the, the beginning that they thought it would be in that area And so when we got this estimate, um, it's aligned with what they've told us from the from the beginning Okay, thank you 
Uh, I'll just add that I bought my tickets. Um, and because I did that, I think that you can keep track of how many tickets have been sold on the on the website because it started at 15,000 and then it drops down to tickets available. So I just checked, we've sold over 1,600. Um, not all of those are adult tickets because I know at least two of them are for my kids. <laughs> uh, but I think that that does show that we're gonna generate a decent, I mean, if they were all adult tickets, that's 16 grand right there. Even if half of them are, that's $8,000 right there. So I do think we're gonna see some decent proceeds um, from the gate. Uh, I, I asked about this and I just wanna again reiterate, I hope that we get a chance for um, some of our student activity groups to get into the concession stand and volunteer mm -hmm. um, to earn some uh, money towards their activity fund costs. Thanks for bringing that up, Lisa. And yes, the ADs from Liberty and City met with Aramark over there and uh, had a good conversation about the concession stands not only that night, but even doing some additional partnerships with Aramark to get more opportunities throughout the football season for some of our groups. And so that is a, a discussion that has been had and is, is, on, is ongoing. Yeah, I know I got hit up to go work for the after prom committee to raise money. So okay. I know some groups are doing it. And uh, to Maka's point, my band kid was excited to do it, but he was very clear to tell me he could care less about football, but he gets to go <laughs> march on the field and do his band thing. So he's excited about that. And I did forget one other piece, and Chris, if you need to chime in, please do. We also are gonna have an online store. We're gonna sell shirts for the Clash at Kinnick that have a design that features both schools and a portion or all of the, the proceeds from those sales are going to go to the children's hospital. Oh, so I'm nice. um, trying to give back a little bit in uh, the context of being able to have this opportunity. Um, one of the cool things about Kinnick, right, is across the nation, they know that we do the wave after the first quarter and we are gonna do that on the 26th. And so really trying to allow our high schools to experience that, uh, that feel of Kinnick on that, on that evening. So we're very excited. Very nice. Any further comments or questions, directors? That was a good idea to pull that so that we talked it through a little bit. All right, I'd entertain a motion. I move that we pass the Kinnick Stadium Rental Agreement. Second. All right, Kim. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. All right, thank you. That takes us down to, uh, we have one public hearing. I would turn it over to Vice President Moore. Now is the time and place for the public hearing on the proposed plans and specifications for the Coralville Central Elementary Front Entrance Project. The Board of Directors set the date for this public hearing on July 26, 2022. Notice of public hearing was published in the Iowa City Press Citizen on July 27, 2022. The district will receive bids on this project at 2 p.m. August 25, 2022 at the Facilities Management Conference Center, 1137 South Riverside Drive, Iowa City, Iowa. Notice to contractors was published as required by law in multiple statewide plan rooms and on the Iowa City Community School District website on July 27, 2022. Are there any questions from the board? Are there any questions from the public? All right, we can close that public hearing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next up, we move into our presentations and we get our quarterly financial report. I'll kick it over to Les. Uh, thank you, uh, President Eyestone. Um, I think I would not uh, characterize this as the closing financial for the year. This is a, primarily a cash basis and all of the end of the year adjustments will have to be made and so there will be a future report with the audit report that will come uh, later this fall uh, that will have the final numbers. So uh, just to caution you that there will be adjustments throughout. Um, it, it continues to project favorably through 2023 with our ESSER funding um, based upon previous reports and then We've continued to maintain the estimates for the, for the years after. Uh, I'm focusing primarily on page 10 uh, where the unspent balance is. And so um, 
you know, we've had a discussion uh, amongst ourselves about uh, what we do. Uh, we are showing that uh, a deficit spending in those three years, and so uh, we are already mindful of that and how we are going to transition through that as we uh, have staff that are in the ESSER funded positions and we absorb those into the system and, and move forward. Uh, we also continue to be very conservative with the number of students that we're projecting as our growth. Um, we're waiting for the demographer's report and that will be updated uh, as soon as that becomes available with what those students might be. So uh, again, we aren't changing any of those estimates moving forward, so there's a, a lot of consistency in this report from what you've seen before. Ooh, lots of silence. Any questions, comments from directors? I know I always scroll right down to that bottom of page 10 and look for the pretty color coding down there um, and, you know, get some scares sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, when I see it. Uh, I, I think it is, you know, I appreciate the fact that it's conservative in both looking at what we might get from SSA and growth and things like that. I think we have to plan that way, right, in order to <laughs> try to make ends meet if we plan uh, too liberal on our spending, we'd, we'd be in trouble. Um, but even so, you know, when you see it kind of the bottom line like this and you see that estimated at the projected at 26 of unspent balance, that's it's pretty low. Mm -hmm. And it gives me a little bit of heartburn, right, <laughs> thinking about it, so. I, I think the response I'd give to that, President Eystone, it is low and it gives us heartburn too uh, when we look at it knowing, um, or if we didn't know that we were going to have to offload some FTE. I mean, that is the, that's the reality. That's been the reality since we funded FTE through the ESSER positions, that we knew we wouldn't be able to carry as many FTE as we have. And so that's why you see that number so drastically dip like that. You see it really improve because we have the ESSER dollars, and then as soon as the ESSER dollars go away, you see how we're, we're really carrying too many FTE in the system to sustain that. And so it'll be important, just like it was important as we approach this year, to make sure that through attrition and um, through those processes that we don't carry more FT than we have to and that we continue to look at that in the years moving forward. We will have some pressure points, right, with middle school and some things uh, that are coming new to us or new things we want to do. Uh, so it's going to take some constant conversation and planning as we approach this uh, to make sure that we don't end up in that declining uh, scenario that's painted there. Um, that, that's without any kind of correction, right? That's just a, making a lot of the assumptions that we carry forward what we have and that's not what we'll continue to do. Any other comments from directors, questions for Les? As always, thanks Les for your work, appreciate it. Looks like we can move on into our discussion items. And first up we have our equity update. It's, um, thank you, so at the last meeting where we discussed uh, what we would do for equity updates, we identified that one of our first updates would be to talk about high reliability schools and its tie into our uh, commitment to equity in the district. We know that we really focus hard on excellence, high expectations for all kids, and that all kids part is really uh, the equity piece of that conversation. And so we've talked to you several times about high reliability schools as our new school improvement framework and our way to try to reduce some variability through the district, uh, line our initiatives, have common language, uh, but most of all, achieve equitable outcomes for our students. And so we're excited about this work and excited to uh, paint the picture about how it um, ties into uh, those equity goals that we have, knowing that really the focus of this first year is on culture. And we know that anything else we do, if we don't have solid culture in place, is going to have diminishing returns. Uh, and so that's really the area of focus that you'll hear the team talk about here again tonight that uh, we'll be uh, working with our building principals on. So with that, I'll turn it over to Amy. Thanks, Matt. Um, Matt gave much of my introduction, so let me see what I need to cut now. Appreciate that. Um, tonight, our equity update, like Matt said, is, has us focusing on our new school improvement framework. Um, Eliza Proctor, Executive Director of Elementary Schools, Lucas Patachek, Executive Director of Secondary Schools, Carmen Guanagali, Director of Curriculum Instruction Assessment, and I will all um, be part of this presentation this evening. Uh, we're going to talk to you about connections that we see um, that are important to our equity work, like Matt mentioned, share a timeline that's been developed that we can use with our staff, um, talk a little bit about where we've been and where we're headed next. 
But we did think it was important at the beginning of the slide deck uh, to go back to a little bit of the information that was shared with you uh, during the May board update. And so we're gonna ask Eliza to open up the presentation with a little bit of that information. All right, good evening. I think I'm a little taller than Amy, so I gotta move that up there. All right, so we are going to go through the five different levels of high reliability schools as it is a framework that supports fulfilling our district vision of equitable outcomes for all students. It gives us common language to name what we're doing, assess our current reality, align our initiatives, and determine where we need to go next. HRS is a vehicle that allows us to balance shared responsibility, autonomy, to make decisions that best meet the needs of all of our students. So as you can see on this slide, High Reliability Schools is a five-level framework. And in each of those levels, there are, varying levels, there are varying numbers of leading indicators to help us determine if we are successfully meeting the criteria. So what we're going to go through with you this evening are the first three levels, um, as those are the ones that we are going to spend the majority of our time on over the next five to six years. At the end of our presentation, Carmen is going to close us out with a timeline so you can see how we are planning on rolling out those first three levels um, over the next course of several years as we know that we cannot say we're doing high reliability schools and we're gonna do everything all in the 22, 23 school year. And so we're really trying to go deep and so we need to go slow in that work to be really meticulous on how we roll this out so we can ensure success. So the first level of high reliability schools is where we're going to be spending a lot of our time this school year. Um, the first level is as Superintendent Degner um, alluded to, is to have safe, supportive, and collaborative school environments. And so you can see in this level, there are eight leading indicators. And so we will talk about leading indicators a lot um, with you over the next several years. And so you can see those uh, outlined here as 1.1, 1.2, all the way through 1.8. Those leading indicators are what will tell us that we are indeed creating safe, supportive, and collaborative cultures. Within those leading indicators, we will then have lagging indicators. And those lagging indicators are those things that we are going to be collecting data around, we're going to be measuring that directly align back to those leading indicators to let us know that we are truly meeting the needs of all of our students in safe, supportive, and collaborative cultures. The next two levels, um, Lucas is going to talk about, and those are pieces that are gonna be foreshadowed on the timeline, but this is really where we've been spending a lot of time with professional learning. Um, today, Amy and I had the pleasure of spending the entire day with the elementary principals and their IDSs and some of our curriculum coordinators at the elementary level to really dig into level one um, to help us determine our areas of growth and where we're going to be going next. Um, we're gonna be focusing our professional learning this year back at the building level around HRS level one and within all of those um, eight indicators. Um, a lot of the time that will be spent at the building level are really gonna be focusing around 1.1, 1.2, and 1.4. 1.1 and 1.2 really get at our positive behaviors, interventions, and supports, gets at our um, matrices, our behavior management, our culturally responsive teaching, our restorative justice and practices, and 1.4 really gets at collaborative teams and the professional learning community. So we are excited to get into level one, have seen a lot of traction with our building leaders and they're excited to get this off the ground. So I will now turn it over to Lucas to talk about the next two levels. All right, Eliza did a solid job of talking through level one, and I just want to emphasize again what uh, Matt, Amy, and Eliza had mentioned as well. Uh, without a solid foundation with level one, these other two levels really don't mean much. Uh, but with level one going on, that's not just happening in, uh, in solo or in isolation with everything else. So I do want to emphasize a little bit of what goes on in levels two and level three. So levels two and three really get to the how and the what is being done. So level two focuses really on the effective teaching within every classroom. So one thing that I do want to emphasize that goes along with that 
about how the work in level two and three is being done while the building's focus is in level one. So looking at what our curriculum coordinators are doing this year along with their building principles is really focusing and learning about how they can lead the work of the new art and science of teaching that really gets into what the effective practices are that happen within the classroom. And as Carmen's gonna show you with the timeline, you'll see what that's gonna look like in the coming years as we introduce that to our teachers and that becomes part of our practice of what goes on in our buildings and in our classrooms. And then when we look at level three, again, that gets to the what. So looking at this particular year, our curriculum coordinators along with their teachers in those content areas are really gonna focus on their priority standards, what is essential for each student to know. And then with those priority standards is really creating those common, sum of, uh, excuse me, common summative assessments that will be taught uh, throughout all of our buildings. And it's the same assessment uh, no matter what building the student goes to. Thank you, Lucas. So it's incredibly important for us to connect our staff back to important documents that we utilize in the district that help to set and communicate overall direction. And when I think about those documents, I think about both the district strategic plan that you see here on the screen, as well as our diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. And as I've done some crosswalk between our HRS levels and our two documents here, when I think about this, of course, we could uh, create some alignment in District Goal 1 and 2 that speak to ELA and math, but this is the one I um, decided to pull out, and that's uh, annually improving the educational experience for our children through culturally inc uh, inclusive and responsive school environments. Oftentimes, when we think about equitable, equitable learning environments, we think about the physical space, and while that's important, this work also lets us get grounded in creating an equitable experience across the entire district. So Eliza and Lucas just went through the first three levels where we're going to focus our time and energy over the next several years. And there's 20 indicators there. And what I was describing today to the elementary IDS and principals is we can think of those like we're classroom teachers and those are the standards that we need to aspire to and want our students proficient in. Same thing here. Those are the things uh, that we want our buildings proficient in over time. So again, uh, creating equity means that all 20 of those leading indicators over time are embedded at, in the fabric of the culture in our buildings. And then as I segue over here to the um, district's equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion plan, you see six, the six goal areas here, and this is, I think, page two or three of that document. When I think about HRS level one, safe and supportive collaborative schools, I can see nice connections here to um, the DEI goals two, three, and five. And I think you could make the case even in some of the other goal areas that it could link back to safe, supportive, and collaborative. But I picked those few out because I saw uh, mentioned there, of course, direct correlation to discipline, inclusive learning environments, and stakeholder engagement, which I felt really fit nicely in level one with the indicators that we see there and also knowing what sits in the survey questions um, behind level one leading indicators. And another time we can come back to you and talk about uh, the surveys that are eventually gonna go out to administrators, staff, and, and families around um, level one items. And then as far as HRS level two and three, effective teaching in every classroom and the guaranteed and viable curriculum, I felt like there was strong uh, connection or a good crosswalk between uh, DEI goals one, three, and six that relate to increasing supports and access to programming, incorporating inclusive and responsive curriculum, and ensuring resources are equitably allocated. All right, so to wrap it up here with our timeline, so as Eliza mentioned and Amy also too, how we're gonna spread the work that we're gonna do with HRS for over six years. The big part of the work we're gonna do this year is gonna be really focused on level one. So we're looking at safe, supportive, collaborative cultures for all of our students and for our staff. The building administrators, curriculum coordinators and our IDS teams will be helping and supporting that work in level one for the rest of this year and into the following school year of 23 and 24. While we're working on level one, in the background, we have our instructional coaches will be working on levels two, so that effective teaching in every classroom, and they'll be getting the training and the support to build capacity around how we can support our teachers in our buildings in that work when we transition into level two in the following year. 
Our curriculum coordinators will be working on level three in that guaranteed and viable curriculum, so establishing priority standards, looking at common formative assessments and common summative assessments, and how we can also build support with our teachers in that process as we transition into level three. And so the role is for this year, the biggest goal, level one, is our focus. And as we transition through our years, even though we're looking at certification in 2023 and 2024 in level one, we'll still be reviewing level one and still coming back to make sure that we're still being accountable to the process and making sure that our systems are still in place for level one. The same thing will apply for level two and level three as we transition through. But the goal is as we're working through one level, we're building support and capacity for the next levels as the programs run through. Sorry. And then finally, where, we, where we've been and where we're going. So the work for HRS has started since February, but in the big scope of everything, we had a great group that met with Dr. Acosta who came in in April, and he was at Liberty High, met with a group of teachers and instructional leaders and admins. Um, and after that process, there was also some meetings where some teams went to Minnesota for, for training on the high reliability part of level two, um, looking at our model of instruction and the new arts and science of teaching. In June, we had a great group that also went to um, Des Moines for a huge training for, for pretty much for three days we were there um, and we had administrators, we had IDS, we had curriculum coordinators and some teachers who were part of that process also and just learning about the HRS process all through levels one, two and three and how we can implement that in our school. So that group has been back and since then we've been working regularly with building admins, we've included IDS in that process today. We've worked with curriculum coordinators yesterday where we met with the whole team for a day and kind of brought them on to pace of where we are and how we're going to help our teachers build support around HRS and the work that we're going to do in our classrooms. And then also, we are going to continue this work now as we go through. For where we're going, um, on the 16th, our curriculum coordinators will be meeting with the teachers and try and give them a brief introduction of what HRS will look like. And on the 17th, we'll have Shelly Geis, who is one of the great leaders for HRS, will be my break big presentation about the HRS model, go through the whole scope of what um, HRS is, and then really dig into PLC's process and how we can work with PLCs and build that process in all of our buildings. After that, we'll have um, academic coaches that will be working with administrators and also with our building teams in August, October, and April, um, and we'll have six days of HRS training for elementary and secondary. So those will be separated, two days for elementary, two days for secondary, and then it goes through in August, October, and in April. And those teams will also be receiving regular PDs throughout the year. So we'll be meeting once a month for full day for elementary and for secondary. Principals and IDS will meet, and then also we have HRS PLCs that will be meeting throughout the day to work on this HRS process and how we can implement the, the work we're doing um, throughout the year. So open up for questions. So I have a question. Um, one of the things that I think that we've pretty routinely heard from um, the community and students is that students want to um, be heard and have a voice and, and um, have input given. And it seems to me that leading indicator 1.2 allows that. But I'm wondering, Amy, could you, or, or somebody else, could you get it, how are we gonna, the nuts and bolts of collecting the data from the students and how often are we checking in with them? Well, what exactly does that look like? Oh, great question and pulled uh, level one back up. So um, as part of this, and I alluded to it a little bit ago when I was talking about surveys. So as part of this, um, each level has a series of surveys that are sent out um, ahead of the work that's being done. So as we're into these coaching academies, these days of our own professional development, again with the groups that Carmen was describing, between that August date and October date, we are going to administer several surveys. Behind each of these leading indicators for level one, there's several survey questions. And there's, um, uh, I wish I knew the number, maybe someone off the top of their head, up to maybe like 30 survey questions total. Administrators will receive um, a survey, uh, the staff will see, receive a survey, students will receive the survey, and um, the community or parents will receive that survey as well. They're, they all ask similar types of questions, and so as the questions and responses come back, you can see um, you know, an item related to, like, I feel like I have a feedback loop with um, the administration or the 
the building, you'll see how all four groups responded to a similar type of question. So that's going to be the baseline of, of our work. Um, that's going to, we're going to get scores based on that, and we'll have, um, through the coaching academy, recommendations about, you know, if you're building scores and are falling out in this, you know, whatever the number is that they suggest to us, a three or lower, that, that's probably where you need to dig in and do more work. If you're seeing on Likert scale um, scores consistently come in at four and five, maybe you continue to do the work that you're doing in your building. Make sure you have some conversation around what that good work is, what you want to harken back to and not forget to continue it. Um, but let's dig into the, um, the survey items that you know, parents and others were responding to that needs more attention. From there then, they're going to have to develop kind of their own mechanisms for progress monitoring. Okay, we know the status coming in a little bit lower. What do we think we can do for an improvement? Let's start that work, but how are we gonna monitor that improvement? And they call that quick data. And so there's different types of quick data. And so great questions, but that's kind of the process. Now, what we, what we haven't gone back to is how soon from, um, from that point um, between August and October would we ever re-administer that same series of survey questions. That's kind of an unknown for us at this point. But it sounds like the quick data could be a smaller subset targeted at what needs to work on and Absolutely. Because I remember I got to go to the April presentation. I remember Dr. Costa pulled up his school for us and was like, this is the data from two days ago. And it, and it seems really powerful. I just, I didn't know if we were going to be able to monitor that closely yep. because it seems like the closer we can monitor, the better it's going to work. Absolutely. Yeah, I usually like to let everybody else weigh in, but that, that's exactly where my head was at. Uh, you know, I spend most of my day looking at leading and lagging indicators at work, right? And if you're not checking in fast enough, your leading indicators quickly become lagging indicators because you don't know until it's too late, right? So I, I think the cadence that you're reviewing these things is important. I understand that you're not sending out a survey to parents and students every day, right, to get a daily pulse on it, because that's just untenable, but, uh, you know, there's got to be something, you know, in the meantime, as you're going along, right, that you're, like, constantly turning the boat if you need to yeah. tweak it a little bit, so that's exactly where my head was at. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> another leading indicator that's of interest to me on a, in level one is 1.6 where parents, students, and community, mm -hmm. community members have formal ways to give input regarding optimal operations of the school. To me, that formal way phrase indicates um, uh, things for students to be involved in in the operation of the school beyond interpreting uh, surveys. Is that fair? I think that's fair, and um, we've done some work behind the scenes to have buildings make connections to work that they're currently doing that relate to these leading indicators, or just um, having the awareness that this is going to be the expectation, and so what might we start to do to ensure that we have formal ways? And I think that this could happen in a variety of ways, Charlie. It could be through Qualtrics or Google surveys that go out. It could be through, um, I think of like the Say Something campaign that Kristen and Kate and others have have worked on that. Um, we are getting information from students right away if um, they're having problems with other students or staff members. So those are the kinds of things that I think about as w in the way of formal ways. But the leading indicators, remember, that's kind of our non-negotiable as the, as the district expectations. The buildings are all going to come in behind. That's where we talk about that, um, that autonomy for the buildings to figure this piece out um, on their own. Now, that doesn't mean that during these PLC meetings that we're going to offer once a month for our building principals, that they're not sharing, talking, and collaborating about things that are working for them too, right? We don't want these things to just be hidden and, and not known too. If it's working for one building, it's probably going to be good for, for all of our buildings. But formal to me says that you've got kind of a regular check-in or offering, right, that parents and staff and students can um, get to you how they're feeling on any particular subject. And I think 
you know, this is where we're still working on it, right, and trying to look at some things, because the, the other spin I would put on that is this is about improving our systems and structures in the school district, right? And, it's, and so we can get all the data we want, but if we don't do anything with that data, if we don't make any changes, then we haven't really accomplished anything. We've just done a big exercise in collecting data. So to Charlie's point about 1.6, so I would think about, okay, well, what are your structures where you meet with parents and you get that feedback? Is it just surveys or do you have like regular meetings set up? You know, we have some structures, PTO, DPO, but is that reaching your whole parent community? The same thing for students. Do you have any kind of a, what's your student council look like? Do you have a student group that you check in with to get uh, input regarding the structure and system of the school? So I think that's what the improvement work then would be based off of that data. So if, as Amy's sharing that survey data that comes back, if that one's low and they don't feel like they have those ways, then the improvement effort is to go back and create those structures into the school building and then to learn from each other, right? That the principals are sharing, well, this is what we do at this high school, this is what we do here that they can stand some of those things up. Um, even thinking about some of our conversations from the fall with BSUs, you know, did we have all of our BSUs operational? And were they meeting regularly? And they were obviously weren't feeling like they were having ways to give input regarding the school. So that would be a small example too of those structures and systems we'd wanna see born out of this if the data wasn't, wasn't, wasn't showing that those things were occurring. And that work will be guided and uh, pushed by <coughs> The, basically the district staff, not outside groups coming in to me and yelling at me because this was not being done. Is that That's the goal, Charlie, right? This, this is like, um, when you guys were just talking about the survey data, like I also think about it, good teaching, right? We do a summative assessment, which means kind of like you might think about it, the old school end of the chapter test, right? Well, what are we doing along the way for more formative assessment, which, which would be maybe like a quiz, right, that we'd think about in a more traditional sense to get indicators of that. So if we don't have those systems and structures in place where kids can come to and talk to us or parents can't come talk to the school or there's just not a way they know how to navigate that, that's when they end up at our microphone, right? And that's when they end up frustrated here. And so part of our job is thinking about, again, that phrase you've heard me say a few times, reducing variability in the system that when we have good practice, how are we growing good practice and learning from each other through the system so that we can avoid some of those situations from occurring or where that they feel their only outlet is to come here to be able to provide impact or input on their school. Okay, thank you. Is there other data we'll be looking at other than assessments and feedback? You know, for instance, if we are building a safe, supportive um, environment, I would think that our discipline might look different, our bullying numbers might look different. Um, is, um, can you speak to that? Yeah, so one thing I would say is our district and building CSIP school improvement plan process is not going away. So we're still collecting and monitoring data in our academic areas that we always have, as well as our discipline areas, our climate and culture survey. Um, data, uh, those are the, those key areas we're always going to monitor. The buildings will have to decide if that's, um, as they're watching that data and responding to um, creating their action plans for the CSIPs, is, is what they're seeing in their data working? And would they say that that can um, be part of their lagging indicators that are showing why we, we are um, proficient in 1.1 and 1.2? So I always think about PBIS, uh, social emotional behavioral supports, is, directly uh, connected to 1.1, 1.2. If I were a building administrator and an instructional leadership team in our buildings, I would be wanting to utilize our office disciplinary uh, referral data, maybe our seclusion and restraint data, suspension data, as data I'm monitoring to see the health of our building. That to me will also help tell me if, the build, if we're being successful that, uh, and showing you know, the students and the staff and our parents that this is a safe environment for us to be in. So it's twofold. Now, we, ha we haven't gone out as far to say you must create this particular lagging indicator for any of these leading indicators. We're leaving that up to the buildings at this point um, anyway. We've, in talking with some of the districts as we were um, thinking about whether to um, partake in this journey with HRS, we did hear from them that um, sometimes uh, in different years they might say a, a lagging indicator for a building must be x y or z so for example cedar rapids schools i believe it, um, shared with us that they wanted four different positive contacts each year um, as far as parent engagement so that was one thing they put on there so they created a lagging indicator expectation we haven't gone about that work yet but we've had lots of discussion about what would we do i can say uh, confidently that 
in, in a way, we do expect certain lagging indicators because we ask them to monitor the data that in the in the CSEPs. Is that making sense, Jane? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I, I don't really have any questions. I, you know, I'm excited about this. I, th I think, you know, when I think, you know, over the past 10 years or so, um, you know, one thing we've done really well uh, is, is have a, a really good environment for teachers, right? Because n nothing else is more important, right? As far as student achievement goes, your teacher, I mean, that's just far and away. And so over the years, we've done a great job at, at fostering that relationship. Uh, obviously, as we talked in, um, when we pulled uh, the personnel agenda, we're not having problems other schools are having, and that's because of the work that's been done over the, you know, the past uh, decade or more. Um, the other thing that we've done really well, and obviously we'll talk about it later tonight, but is our facilities, right? We've had plans, um, FMP 1.0, FMP 2.0, and to me, you know, this is that next step, and we're doing it in a broader way with culture, with climate, with educational outcomes, with, with what actually goes on in the classroom and, and attempting to get rid of a lot of that variability mm -hmm. where, you know, one person might have a really great experience um, and in the very same building someone else, you know, might have a very different experience. And, and so just, you know, from reading the books and from um, a new role, you know, diving into this deeper uh, on a professional level, it, it's really exciting to finally come together, you know, where it's not, I mean, just traditionally, right, you're a teacher, you're alone in your classroom, and if you're great, great, and if you're not great, you're alone in your classroom and, and you're teaching the exact same thing for 20 years, and it's just not so great, and so uh, this is just a great way to get at it, and it's thorough, um, obviously it's going to take time, but this is the first time I've ever seen that, you know, going back to working in the district, a six-year plan mm -hmm. for how we're going to start to integrate these things. And, and knowing, number one, how deep in the research this is and how well formulated all of these concepts and ideas are, not just in education, but really in, in other um, areas as well. So it's, it's just really exciting to see, you know, I've, when, we, when we came out with FMP 1.0, that was the first time in this school district we had a 10-year plan for our facilities. This is the first time in this school district that we have a consistent, long-standing plan for what's going on in the classroom. Um, and it's just exciting that you folks clearly have, have got this, have brought this to the board. Uh, I'm excited to support it, and I'm just really excited to see how it rolls out. So thank you. Thank you, JP. I did have one thought as to piggyback off Director Eastham's comment on you know formal ways to get involvement i know that i in the past and a former director wrestler actually in the past too both of us had talked about i want to get my letters wrong the SIAC, the mm -hmm. school improvement advisory committee has not always been i don't know fruitful uh, i think there's been ways it could be used a lot more and i know that's a global thing and maybe we look at you know how does that pared down to all the individual schools and something like that. So just something to think about, a, another opportunity that parents and students, you know, people across the district have been part of that. Um, you know, it's a, it's a limited number, obviously, that way. But so maybe if it's expanded across the district, maybe you can get more people involved. That'd be just a thought, because I know it's been brought up before, and it seems to fit with that standard. Are there? Comments or questions from directors? All right. Thank you, team. We can, well, I guess, was there anything else from the team on the equity update? That we no, to... Thank you. All right. Next discussion item is our Hills discussion. And you'll see, I, I think you have the same uh, attachment there as, as you do down at the the FMP one, because they're kind of tied together. Um, I don't know, Matt, are you going to kind of kick us off here? Or? Yeah, I sure can. Thanks, President Eyestone. So uh, we've talked about Hills at a few different meetings and uh, are bringing it back here uh, to you this evening for uh, discussion. And then we do have the action item later in the meeting uh, for FMP 2.0, which you'll notice uh, includes our recommendation to continue uh, with the Hills uh, project, as was listed in uh, the original FMP 2.0 uh, that you guys approved in April. 
Uh, we've had some uh, questions, provided some data back, um, kind of the outstanding question that I think we wanted to spend some additional time going through with you this evening was uh, some question about attendance areas and what that could look like. And so Adam has uh, some attendance area creation that um, he's included uh, here just to kind of walk through what some different examples would be with, with hills, without hills, uh, so that we could address uh, that question as well. Um, you can see the, the different reasons that we kind of anchor to there for uh, continuing that recommendation around Hills Elementary, uh, but we'd be happy to answer any additional questions from, from the memo. Um, the other FMP items probably make sense to wait till we get down to the action item around FMP 2.0, but you can tell that we've also mentioned the, the West High secure front entrance in that memo um, and a couple other slight adjustments, but we should probably hold those to the action item if there's questions on that. So with that, um, like I said, I, I'm not going to walk through the, the whole um, stated memo with you there, um, assuming you had uh, time to look at that. And if you have questions, we'll follow up on that. But otherwise, I'm going to transition right to Adam and let him walk through uh, just what those different attendance zone uh, scenarios would look like. And if um, we need to address any further questions on that, we sure can. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to walk through four different attendance zone scenarios. It probably goes without saying, but developing attendance zones is a very detailed process and involves a lot of input, takes a lot of time. So basically what I've done here um, is really just try to adhere to the principles that we've used in boundary development in the past to develop some realistic scenarios based upon decisions that the board makes. Um, so really trying to put a picture and put some numbers to decisions you'll make. Before I, I jump into these, I do want to make clear what the numbers are that appear here. Um, the enrollment numbers are probably going to look low. They're going to look low for all of the, the buildings and attendance zones that are referenced. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One, these are K-5 numbers because we're talking about a decision that would take place after we make the transition to middle schools. They don't include that sixth grade class. So these aren't going to look like the enrollment numbers we have right now. They're also only K-5, and the reason for that is that these are resident student numbers. So these aren't enrollments at the school, these are how many students actually reside within the zone. And because our preschool programming hasn't been offered across the district and parents have a little more flexibility in terms of where that takes place, using resident pre-K numbers can be pretty misleading. So preschool students not included in these, sixth grade not included, also open enrollments into the district because they are by definition not resident students are also not included. So just bear that in mind. Um, as we move forward. Uh, the other thing that I'll note before jumping in is that these numbers are based on where students live right now. Um, so anything that would happen to change those numbers, new housing development, shift in population, whatever the case may be, um, between now and two or three or four years down the road obviously aren't reflected either. Um, so the first scenario that I want to share is uh, simply a New Hills Elementary. Um, the attendance zone would remain unchanged, and I tried to be kind of as non-disruptive but realistic as possible. So the attendance zone here remains unchanged. That's a picture of the Hills attendance zone as it sits right now. Um, the low SES percentage, 65.1% based on current resident student population, um, and then English language learner population, 36.8%. So that's current numbers for Hills, K-5 stu resident students, 106 students for that attendance zone. Um, jumping ahead, and these are in no particular order. Another option, uh, another scenario is to close Hills Elementary and build nothing new. Uh, if that were to happen, the uh, scenario that I, that I drew here would be to wrap the Hills Attendance Zone into the Alexander Attendance Zone. Uh, you can see here the um, impact on, and that's actually incorrect, the Hills number should be zero here. That was a cut and paste error, I think. Um, but the impact on Alexander would be that it would increase to 383 resident students in K, K through 5. That's a change of plus 106, which are the Hills uh, numbers there. Um, you'll see that the SES ELL percentages are very similar to what they are at Alexander right now. That's not surprising since both schools, as they stand right now, are very similar in terms of those particular demographic characteristics. But uh, the blue, I think it's blue, I'm colorblind, so forgive me if it's not, but the blue area here is what that attendance zone would look like with those two combined. And I can jump back to these for questions if you have any. 
Uh, third scenario would be a new Southwestern Elementary School that also replaces Hills Elementary. So in this case, the Alexander Attendance Zone is not impacted. Um, what it would do is cut some from the attendance zones in Weber current attendance zone, from Horn's current attendance zone, and from Longfellow's current attendance zone just south of the Iowa City Municipal Airport. And here you can see what that would look like in terms of numbers. So a new uh, Southwestern Elementary would be 314 students, again, resident K-5 students. Um, low SES, ELL, you can see the percentages there. I won't go through all of them. But then the impact on Longfellow would be to remove a pretty substantial number of students. Um, that's kind of a tough one. It's, you know, it's impacting Longfellow, which is a long way away uh, from potentially a new Southwestern Elementary School. Um, but as we look at boundary scenarios, that's one of those, it's kind of an all or nothing in terms of whether that group of students is included. Um, Weber, uh, small reduction percentage-wise in number of resident students there. Um, and then Horn, uh, fairly large reduction in terms of the portion of the Southern Horn attendance area that would be grabbed. And then the fourth scenario that I mapped out would be a new school in Hills um, and a new Southwestern Elementary School. Uh, the new school in Hills, um, basically the way I did it, forecasted no change to the attendance zone. So that attendance zone looks the same as it does now. The numbers are the same as they are now. The new Southwestern Elementary School would have 208 resident K-5 students. Um, and then you can see the impact on the other schools. In this, in this scenario, uh, that would offer substantial growth capacity um, at the new Southwestern Elementary School for future housing development, also offer growth capacity at a Hills Elementary School as well. Um, so those are the, the quick scenario rundowns. I'm happy to answer any questions about those. I wish we had those in front of us um, so I could see them all at once. This is a lot of information to take in in a meeting. Um, so is there a way to show all four scenarios at once? Uh, certainly there would be. I'm not sure that I can do that right at the moment, though. I wouldn't know how to either. <laughs> yep, I just yep. wondered if you happened to. I don't really know how, I'm, how I can take this information in meaningfully right now. Um, one, so wait. Either Hills, on, on the charts you've created, Hills is either the um, catchment area does not change or it closes? Correct. The, the, the four scenarios drawn, two of them, scenarios one and four, Hills stays the same and the, the attendance zone stays the same. Yep. Why didn't we look at um, changing the attendance zone for Hills? Yep, I would, you know, see if Chase or Matt has input on that. You know, I was really just looking at kind of simplifying the, the impact that any change would have. Well, I think we could, the problem would be, like Adam started with, that changing a t one attendance zone, you change multiple attendance zones. And so in some way, shape, or form, we had to frame uh, the work I was asking Adam to do and to draw some hypothetical scenarios. So we assume we haven't had a conversation about changing the Hills attendance area. We have had conversation about a Southwest Elementary School. Uh, we do have an Alexander area. We do have these other school campuses. Uh, but we didn't really try to manipulate the Hills attendance area uh, in any of these scenarios. So. Um, I, I took our direction as looking at what potential scenarios would be and how it would interact with the, the new Southwest Elementary School. Um, one thing that Adam didn't cover is we do expect substantial development and would need room uh, for that substantial development on the Southwest side of town. So that number of 208 doesn't include any new homes, any new development that would be there. The same could go for Hills, right? With the new construction of a new school, this isn't necessarily accounting for that in any of those numbers that you see there with Hills. Okay, so the current, and I understand, um, I'm the main um, uh, uh, um, person that's questioning this decision, and I, I want to make clear, um, I understand why people from Hills want to have that school in Hills, and I think if we do have a school in Hills, it appears that it needs to be a new build. Um, but our job is not to represent a town, it is to represent the best interests of all students. And 
I um, can just say, for example, um, you know, right now, or in our numbers last year, 67 kids were bused down to Hills. Um, they don't, they're not saying, yes, please keep busing us. I have to listen to those parents too. I also have to consider that we heard tonight about our FTE having to um, be cut to some extent. I mean, we have elected people that um, aren't funding public education. So we are going to be in trouble with funding. And I'm looking at this thinking, you know, if I'm a Weber parent, I would like to have more teachers. Uh, with our current catchment area, we have to impose the highest level of RAM. That means we have to have more teachers down there. There are a lot of other students in the district that could use more teachers. And RAM is not supposed to be used um, indefinitely. I imagine it is working pretty well down there. That's why we have RAM. I mean, we have a great teacher to student ratio. We have to, because what we did is we made it so that some of the poorest families you can find are all going down to hills. I don't understand why we're not looking at that catchment area again when we know it has, if not the highest, the second highest low SES rate in the district and only approximately 35 kids live in hills that go to hills. So as much as those kids that live there want to go to Hills, because it's your town, and my family's from small town. We're from Brooklyn and Anamosa, okay, and Ida Grove. I understand how important a school is, but I have to think about how do you think the other kids feel? They're having to bust down there once you don't have RAM. I, I don't understand why we're not thinking forward about how to make schools more equitable in terms of the SES, I mean, that's something we've talked about for over a decade. That's my, I mean, that was my question from the beginning. I wanted to know about how we could make it so we don't feed a school some of the highest FRL students in the whole district. And, and I do talk to the families that go down there and they would like to know that too. Why are we getting bust? Why aren't we going to school in Iowa City where we live? I get it. If my kids went to Hills and we lived in Hills, I would want to keep that school in Hills. I get it. But as a board member, I have to do what's in the best interest of 14,000 plus kids, not what's in the best interest of a town. I wish we could. We don't have funding to be that kind of safety net for a town. So I have to think about everybody. And my position on this has been pretty clear. I'm not a hell no. To, to a school in Hills. I'm a, why are we doing this right now without the demographer information that is coming our way? Why aren't we waiting three months for when that comes? We're talking about there's a Southwest school on the FMP. There's also a Southeast school on the FMP. You can meet with city people and ask them about their demographer, demographer's information about that growth. It's not that much of a mystery where the growth is going to be. What's what I'm missing is information, and I've asked for it, and if I can get it, I'll vote for the school in Hills. But until I have the information, how can I do that when I have, again, 14,000 minus 35 kids? And again, when we don't have money to keep putting RAM in there like we have it. I don't, I don't understand why we're not rethinking who goes to the school. And the other thing I would mention is, we got letters from people about how this was in the FMP 2.0. The same people talking about that acknowledged we didn't even vote on that until April, okay? The FMP 2.0. In other words, there was no action taken at all on the FMP 2.0. You might have been talking about it, and there was mention of previous meetings. For example, the one that happened, I think, it was in 2017, I can't remember the year, Mr. Hemingway referenced it. Go back and listen to it. No one talked about who goes to Hills. No one asked the Hispanic families from Regency and Cole if this is a good idea for them. No one said, hey guys, just so you know, when we have a ratio of one to 15, it means we're not putting teachers other places either. 
None of the data was explored in any of those meetings. It feels real good to build a new school in Hills, but we gotta do it with information in front of us. So I would move to table it, since we just saw for the for, for, first time, four maps. And I'm pretty good at understanding this stuff, and I've been studying it a lot. I can't memorize that while I'm sitting here. I can't work through all the iterations. And I especially thought I would have an iteration that involved some redistricting of the catchment area of hills, okay? I would move to table this. I would move to table it for a month, for two months. I don't understand why we're forcing it. That FMP 2.0 was voted on in April. We're voting on it again tonight to change it. We get to vote on it whenever we want to change it. As it was referred to in the memo from the administration, it's a living document. So there's no sure thing in that FMP 2.0. We already decided we're gonna go with the middle school model. Okay, that's a big change. Because funding changes, right? And demographics change. So again, if I could have information so I could say, yeah, hey, this is where the growth is supposed to be. Not just theoretically, I believe the word was moderate growth in Hills. I mean, cities do this all the time. We get demogra demographers' reports about this stuff. We're expecting one. Why don't we use it? Why don't we look at these maps and figure it out? Why would we build the school first when the current catchment area produced the highest FRL in the district? Has 30 or 37, 38% ELL. That takes a lot of resources to meet the needs of 38% ELL, okay? So I would just like to move to table it until we can have information that is my understanding. Well, now we have this. We could take some time, maybe look at it, maybe understand it, ask questions, see if there's different iterations we could get from it. For example, changing the catchment area of hills and get the demographer study. Shouldn't be long for us to do that. But I'd have to have someone second it. I, I won't second that. I, I won't vote for tabling this. Um, I guess I, I wonder, um, I wasn't as involved, but I, I, I'm sure that the question of Hills came up during FMP 1.0. I'm sure that during that process, people brought it up, they were concerned about it, and I, I, what did people say about it then, before the bond? We put it in the bond. They had $850,000 put into it, and that was the promise we made in the FMP 1.0, because in those conversations, we still had a lot of unknown about the numbers, and the current demography information at that time, thought um, the projection was that you'd have a significant decrease at the school. Now, I don't think that's happened, I think maybe you've stayed the same. So, but the numbers we had at that time were real bleak for Hills. If we could get these new numbers and they're like, no, seriously, this could work, right? We, we're gonna see development, we're gonna see people come in. I'm not a scientist in that, but people are. And again, when we're looking at these maps, I see Southwest, what about Southeast side? We've got two other schools on the FMP. You know, I guess, I guess you know, I voted for the bond. I campaigned for the bond. I, I voted for the save and the pebble. And one thing I've learned, you know, in the time on the board is to trust the staff and that it's really their job to do this. It's, it's not my job. I should look at it. I need to approve it. I need to, I, my job, I feel, is to reflect what the community wants. And, and I'll tell you, when when <laughs> community voted for that bond, and I did, we voted to spend a whole lot of money on Lincoln and Shimmick and Mann. The, that's not a monetarily efficient decision, okay? We have built those schools. I would argue that um, Mann and, and Lincoln, that's 100 years worth of work. Um, Mann's, not a lot of families are moving into that neighborhood around Mann. I would say that it's lots of student rentals. I don't think we looked at that, the board did not look at that demographic information. They didn't ask about is the Lincoln neighborhood. If you look at the Lincoln boundaries, we bus a whole lot of kids into Lincoln. It's hard to get to that school. It doesn't make a lot of sense to build on that sensitive slope and to spend a lot of money, but that's what Iowa City voted for. That's the kind of community that says Cedar Rapids closed eight schools, and I don't think there was much of a blink. I don't think there was community uproar because that's that community. 
But this community supports smaller schools and spending a whole bunch of money on them to make them really nice. To me, that's Iowa City Community School District. Hills is a part of that. So to me, I don't need all this, I don't need all this, nobody asks this data on Shimmick. Nobody asks this data on Lincoln. We do have the FRL, all that data, we had all of it. Yeah, but I don't think we data. got specific demographic targeting those schools. I think as a whole, the community said, we support small schools and we're gonna spend money on them, lots and lots of money. And I agreed with that, I still agree with that. I think this is an example of that. I think this is an example of reflecting community value. That's my belief. I, you know, it, I, I would anticipate if, if you have a very nice school in Hills, there will be growth down there. Not as a demographer, just as someone who's been elected by the community, who it, this, this is what I believe. Uh, it's, it, it happens in other places. I, you know, I think when we look, and to me, when we look at this, we probably need both of these things. W Weber, that's a really big school. I don't know that that's a good idea. But we have some of those too. Is it, is it a smart to have an elementary school that operationally efficient, but is it educationally the smartest way to go? And is it what this community supports? Th that was my reflection. And when, when folks pass Save and Pepple, and again, the community feedback we've got, we've gotten exactly two emails, two, saying yeah, maybe we should, well, any, and I, don't, I think one, of, one person sent an email, Chain, the emails were different. One said it's time to move on and close it, and the other email was talking about magnets. But literally, we've heard from two community, I've heard from two, maybe other folks have heard from more people. I've literally heard from two people in this entire community who, who want to go down that path. So I have to also take that into consideration is the amount of feedback, and it's not just from people from Hills. I've heard from people, I'm from Coralville, so probably a lot of my feedback comes from that area, and that's what I hear too, is this is, this is the way this community voted, this is what people voted for, this is what they thought they were voting for, and, and, and that's it. So that's the dissension I've heard. I mean, I, under, I hear what you're saying, but I don't think we've answered those exact questions in that specificity for all these other schools, these smaller neighborhood schools, some of which are very inconvenient to get to from a geographical standpoint. Lincoln, probably the best example. That's hard to find, it's hard to get to. The neighborhood around there isn't, isn't growing, so we bring people in from other neighborhoods, and it, and it works out really well. Um, and Hills, I, I agree with the RAM, and that's why we probably have room. We have room to adjust the RAM. We've done it a couple different times on this board. When we ran into budgetary problems, we just said, we're changing RAM. We're, we're, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna get rid of one level of RAM and we're gonna have larger class sizes. And it's actually allowed the staff to be very nimble, very flexible when it comes to staffing and allowed us to keep our FTE. Because I've seen these folks do it before, when we were facing uh, almost $6 million in budget cuts and we didn't have to let anybody go, I trust that the staff we have can do that again because I've seen them do it before, and I feel that's another big part of my job is when it, we're dealing with this high-level stuff, to trust the administration to bring us their best recommendation. And I believe that's what they're doing now, and that's why I would intend to support it. I would just go back to, there is no um, similarly situated school, uh, 35 kids live there, that go there, and the FRL is off the charts, and there are a lot of kids, a lot of families, that don't want to have to go 10 miles south to go to school outside of the town they live in. So I do hear from those people. I heard from them for two and a half hours last night. I mean, they don't get to come to meetings very much, right? And they don't speak English. So it's not so easy for us to hear from them. But they're the ones who go there, 67 of them. There's only 130 kids. That's most of the kids, like, by a lot. I worry that we're having those, these conversations we didn't hear from people in the community, well, those are the people getting bust, and they aren't, they don't have a strong voice in the community, right? Instead, they did come here, and then we met last night, and they voiced their position on it. I understand, it's not gonna get tabled, and they're gonna vote yes for this. My point is, and I think we have a good administration, my point is, 
I want to make a more informed decision, and I still don't have the information I wish I had. Um, JP, I agree with every th point that you made, and you did so very eloquently. Um, thank you, thank you for making those. Um, I'm really excited about this new elementary school in Hills, and and I hope that we're moving forward with it. Um, I think it presents. I, I understand some of the concerns that Director um, Pilcher Hayek has, but I think that, especially as it relates to the RAM being a band aid and the FRL percentages we have. But you know, when, when Dwayne said we're looking at a building that may fit 400 um, a couple of months ago, I think, because we've been talking about this for so long, that gave me pause because we don't have 400 kids. But as we got some feedback and as I've been thinking about it, I think that presents an opportunity to do something really special and amazing down in Hills. We could look at doing something. I, I know one of the speakers said a dual language immersion program. That's a bit of a heavy lift because of so much of the certification and, and the special teaching and, and curriculum that needs to go in. But we could do something like a year-round school. And, and that is not as heavy as a lift. And that could be a thing that we offer all of the people at Hills uh, that live in the catchment area. You, you get to go and then lottery it up for the rest of the district, see who wants to come in, maybe get another 100, 150 kids uh, from across the district down to Hills who voluntarily want to make the journey down there because their parents want to take advantage of some unique programming. That adjusts the FRL, that fixes some of those. I mean, I think that we have amazing opportunities to get creative and do wonderful things in Hills. We gotta build it. And we gotta build it now. Because what sat with me again and again with FMP uh, 1.0 is what Dwayne always told us, on time and under budget. And the problem that there is in, in delaying these is we increase our costs and we're not going to be on time and under budget. We've now have, be, because of the discussion that, that the board has been taking around this, we have now pushed the completion off by a year. So we're gonna see tens of thousands of dollars of increased costs for materials, plans, labor, because of what we're doing. So there are very real impacts that happen to the fiscal management of this district when we make decisions like let's table it and, and see where we are in another three months. As, as a, I, I've said this before, I think one of our greatest responsibilities from this board table is to be fiscal stewards of how we spend our money. And I cannot just allow us to incur tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands possibly, dollars of extra money um, when, when, what, when to me what we're doing is right in front of us and, and the path forward is, is, is really clear. So um, I too wouldn't second the motion to table um, and I look forward to voting on the action item as written. Um, it was an interesting discussion with wide ranging. Um, in, in my approach or my thinking about uh, building a new school in the Hills community, uh, I have tried to pay attention to what the Hill, residents of Hills and nearby have told us about what they value in the, in the, in the city of Hills why they think it's, why they want us to support the uh, uh, continuation of the city's uh, uh, development um, and what that means to the district to go ahead and uh, not leave uh, or, or not create the only, I think, incorporated city in the school district boundaries that doesn't have an elementary school in it. Um, <clears throat> I'm not really willing to do that, uh, despite the arguments that our primary purpose is uh, education and not uh, community development. I think they're intertwined, and uh, uh, <clears throat> and we need to pay attention to, uh, to, all, to all aspects of uh, where we locate uh, elementary schools. Um, <clears throat> I, 
intrigued by Director Williams' notions about uh, uh, having a, a different purposes uh, with the uh, with the building with the new building in Hills, uh, purposes which might uh, alleviate or, or change the. Uh, um, uh, change the placement of, of students who are living in the coal communities and in the uh, um, what's the name of the Re Regency? Sorry, thank you. Uh, in the Regency communities, um, <clears throat> who may have uh, who, uh, you know, uh, I think Director Pilcher Hayek, Hayek has been very helpful in uh, pointing out that. Uh, uh, Parents may may want to see their kids going to a different, a more a closer school, to where they're living. Uh, now I'm not quite so sure that there's a, a very, there are very many closer schools available for us, for that end. Um, but anyway, by doing the thing, some of the things or looking at some of the things that Director Williams has sort of talked about, we may be able to come up with a change in attendance areas that has some attractiveness and uh, to. Uh, to, to many people. Uh, so I am, <clears throat> I'm quite comfortable with going ahead and just send uh, voting on the um, uh, updated FMB 2.0 action items tonight and going ahead with our planning for a new building in Hills. I just want to remind I think you made very good arguments. Um, it's something I've been trying to push the narrative about how it is a town that's part of our district community. Um, and to say that, you know, they'd be the only town without a school, I think that's a very compelling argument. Again, I'd, I'd like to vote for this school. <laughs> um, I just really am concerned about the catchment area. And then back to responding to you and Director Williams. Um, we did talk about there being a magnet school, which is something that the district has a lot of information on. We've done studies on it. Um, we know how to do it. And this would be a great opportunity. Um, the Hispanic population, we talked about it last night. We tried to come up with how to, what to call it, and it would be Escuela Magnetica. Mm -hmm. And that's not a term that they would usually use, and it was kind of funny to us, like literally a magnet. Um, what a great opportunity, and, uh, and they all said, I bet if we did that, people with, um, people with higher income would be willing to come down to Hills. But they said, otherwise, why would we want to go to a whole other town to go to school? Like, why, why would they do that? So I think that we have a school right now. Like, we are building a school. It's going to happen. Um, but right now, we have that catchment area. Right now, we have the highest FRL in the district. And um, that, that's why I think we need to prioritize, since we're doing this, um, making it appealing to more people so that we don't just gerrymander the poorest people and put them down there. So um, I, I won't be seconding your motion, um, but I do want to thank you for bringing this to the board. Um, we need diversity of thought. Um, we need dissenting opinions. Um, that is the power and the purpose of a board, is to come together with different opinions so that we produce a better solution than any one of us singly can, can come up with. And I think that the silver lining of all of this is that all of this discussion has generated a lot of these ideas from the community um, in terms of a community school um, that Mr. Muller brought up in the Press Citizen article, um, the idea of a dual language program, which um, I, um, I am very supportive of, um, and uh, Director Williams' idea of a year-round school. Um, none of these ideas would have, would have surfaced had you not brought these legitimate concerns to the table, and so I wanna thank you for that. Um, I, also want to reassure Director Williams about the price of materials and lumber because those prices have only come down in the last six months. Um, and so I think you know, we, can, we can be reassured that we, um, and I know this because my family owns a lumber yard, um, <laughs> so we can be reassured that that's, that's not the case, that we're not going to be spending a lot of more money because we've delayed this by a couple of months. Um, 
so uh, I, I won't, you know, I, I'm supportive of, of building that school there, but I, I do echo Director Pilcher Hayek's call for more in information, more transparency, um, and maybe a more concrete plan of what we're actually going to do with that school because, I, you know, I'm very intrigued by some of these ideas. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, if I'm voting yes for, it, it would be nice to know that ahead of time, and in addition to exactly where the school is going to go, um, which is my other um, concern. But I, I'm supportive and um, just thank you, Director Pilcher Hayek. I appreciate what you've done and also reaching out to the population at, um, at the mobile home parks, which I think is very important. I, I just want to point out for the community that our discussion has been a couple of months, but we've actually delayed it by a year because of the timing of when we have to send bids out for plans and, and all of that. So it, it's not, it, it, it's a much longer delay yeah. than, than a few uh, months. Okay, I, I, I understand that. Um, still, I think, I, I just want to reassure you about the price of materials. They have only come down. I, that's fine for the six months, and then we don't need to get in a back and forth, but we're not building in six months. What we'll be building now, I think, in 12 to 18 months to finish it up by the sign. Dwayne's nodding his head, so I think I've got that right. So, so the way that these schools get built is we have about 18 to 24 months of planning, and there's a, a huge component of the pre-build plan, and then only after that's complete can we start the build. So we're not looking, we're not buying lumber in six months, um, not, not quite yet. Uh, I, I, I think I've been um, very clear where I stand for a variety of reasons on continuing with um, building hills, but I do appreciate hearing um, people's thoughts because as an elected official, and I have shared this with other directors, you know, I am um, a proponent about having discussions at the table, as one of our former directors used to always say, about making the sausage in public so everybody can see how we get to um, our decision. That none of these decisions are um, made sort of behind closed doors. We're not having a conversation getting to that vote because we take our job as elected officials very serious. That's why you um, have heard Director Pilch Pilcher Hyatt, I swear I'm gonna not butcher your name one of these days, um, ask the questions she has asked um, and push the administration to provide the information. I can say that um, my last term as a director, I had the privilege of going down the hills a total of three times and seeing um, our teachers in action, our kids in action in that building. And every time I walked in there, I walked away thinking, man, they need a new school. <laughs> um, it, it's not, in all honesty, it's not a school that I would want my child at. It does not reflect our commitment as a district. And having that as one of the items that we put out publicly, completing the promise, a new school to Hills, that cemented that my stance for that. Because even though um, the language wasn't on Save and Peppel when people voted in November, I talked to countless people who saw that other material and was like, oh great, Hills is getting to school. That was it. I, in good conscience, cannot go back on my word as a elected official. That's where I stand on this and I won't belabor the conversation anymore. I just wanted to get that out. That's my stance. Okay, I'm gonna say my piece. I'm gonna keep it very, very brief, which if you know me, that's hard, uh, but I'm very much a proponent of the culture of and, and I think we can build a new school and look at the boundaries and look at magnets and do all these things, right? I, I don't see any reason why we can't do them both, right? Um, my history on the board is we built a school and decided where it was going to go up in North Liberty and then we figured out the boundaries after the fact because we had to get the building off the ground. And that's what I'm seeing here is I feel pretty comfortable building a new building in Hills and knowing that we can come back and look at 
the catchment area or look at whether or not we want to try and stand up a magnet. I think mag the ideas around magnets we've tossed around forever, and I think they're all great. And if we could figure out how to make one happen and make hills a destination, that's awesome, right? We can still do that after we get the project started. So that that's I want to make sure we're doing both of those things, right? Um, as far as the, I am concerned, I had the same thought, uh, Mary Kate, that you had when uh, Les showed us the numbers, you know, and talked about, you know, make sure we have staffing, we'll lose them by attrition. You know, I I was concerned about that too. I did go back and look at um, our staffing numbers at Hills, and it's really only about three people that you would gain across the district if you disperse them all because there are a lot of singletons there there's only there's two or three grades I think that split into two that maybe if you organized it different you wouldn't have had to do that so there are a few FTEs there that you could save it's not a not a huge number um, so that wasn't uh, like it didn't tip anything for me in that regard um, I am I know we had a lot of discussion over the years, I remember the, the first year uh, on the board uh, when we were meeting every week during the summer looking at boundaries um, and uh, balancing the demographics was the primary goal of that, right? Um, because we were looking at results where when you had very disparate demographics, you had very disparate results. Um, I am a results-based person and this is the exception to the rule up to this point, right? I mean, a few people have mentioned that Hills was a blue ribbon school, right? Because they broke the mold and have had great results despite their FRL numbers. So as a results person, uh, I have to feel fairly good about that. But at the same time, right, if, if we're, you know, families are not happy with where they're going to school and we can look at that, I think that's fine. But at this point, I'm, I think we have to take the first step and build the school and then work out all those details after the fact. So that's where I'm at. All right, so I'm gonna pause there for a second. We kind of got ahead of ourselves a little bit. We do have an, an action item later on that this dovetails into. There's a little more to it, as Matt alluded at the very beginning of this conversation. So we can certainly have more conversation when we get down there if we need to. Um, but unless people uh, disagree with me, I think we can move on to get through our other discussion items. I was forgetting that that was um, when we take action on it. I want to say that I appreciate um, the board members that have communicated with me about this respectfully and that this is a big decision and it affects everyone in the district, not just the people that live in Hills. So I appreciate the conversation. And it's also no fun to be the person that sits here and says this when a whole town's pissed off at me. But I needed to know the information and we got some of it. All right. That's it. Thank you, Mike, I appreciate it. Let's go ahead and move on uh, to our next item. Uh, ironically, it's boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Um, it is pretty ironic. Trying to lighten the moon a little bit. We're <laughs> revisiting a conversation that uh, Director Williams had uh, kind of brought to the board table around uh, looking at potential unassigned areas through the district. So, uh, again, here we have a few examples um, that we think would speak to that. And so it's, it's really, I think, just to show you some examples and get your reaction to. And then if you have any direction for us or uh, any, any additional information you'd like us to come back with, we certainly could. But um, Adam, walk, Adam will walk you through some different examples uh, we created here. Thank you. And I won't go into a ton of detail about these. Really just wanted to show examples of a couple different uh, forms that the unassigned concept, at least as I understand it, could take. Um, so I looked at a few areas that have uh, imminent development within the district, either already under development or we expect that they will soon be under development. And then also looked at some um, 
more rural areas, larger rural areas of attendance zones, and so you can kind of envision how this concept might play out with both. So a um, few quick examples. One, uh, within the Lemmy attendance zone, uh, we currently have, um, this is the current Lemmy boundary. I apologize, the colors are a little difficult to see. Um, and then over on the right, there's a, a concept of carving out what, what really amounts to kind of an, an island within the Lemmy attendance zone. And this, uh, it's a little hard to tell on the map, but this is um, just to the northwest of the interse intersection of Scott and Rochester. Uh, as you look at it, it's an area that we expect to, to be developed. Um, this is one where the number of current students, resident students within this zone is zero. Um, so the impact on any current students of unassigning this attendance zone is zero. But as you can see, the zone as it stands right now is fully contiguous. Whether it's developed, not, has students or not, it's all currently assigned to Lemmy Elementary. Um, similarly, and these are all just examples that I pulled out, so none of them are individually necessarily all that consequential. Um, Shimmick is an area that I looked at as a different model. So this is the current Shimmick boundary um, over here on the left. And you'll see the Shimmick boundary goes all the way down to this bottom part that forms this point. Um, if you looked at identifying the rural portions of the Shimmick attendance zone, um, you know, rural, largely uh, undeveloped areas, um, it would, you know, really uh, include this red bordered area, um, but that does include 53 students. So when you look at Shimmick, when you look at Weber, those are a couple zones that on a map of the district look like they have a really big kind of uh, non-urban unassigned area. There are students within those, but certainly in terms of density, it is a far lower number than we have in the rest of those attendance zones. Um, similarly, so you can envision what that looks like. Um, this is the current Penn boundary over on the left, and uh, the red bordered area over here is the area that's actively under development across from Liberty High School um, that's bounded kind of by North Liberty Road and Dubuque Street. And so you can see that there's uh, that entire zone as of right now would impact fewer than five students, um, but uh, certainly that's an area that we would expect to have substantial development in the future. Um, you can also see kind of in relation to the whole Penn attendance zone uh, where that's situated and where that would fit um, into that attendance zone. Um, and then also, sorry, that got cut off at the top there, but this is the Alexander attendance zone over on the left. And on the right, the red bordered area is the area just south of McAllister Boulevard, um, bounded by Sycamore um, on the east side. And currently there are zero resident students within that zone. That's another area that per city's development plans, we expect substantial development within that zone. Um, so really I just wanted to show you kind of where our two, oh, I have one more, sorry, uh, Weber rural zone. So this is the current Weber boundary, um, really the largest boundary we have geographically within the district. Um, what's really interesting, Weber obviously is a very large school. We just saw in the previous slideshow that its resident student population, K-5, is 483 or something similar to that. Um, but uh, this area, which is all currently assigned to Weber, so any student who lives in this area, Weber's their school. Um, if we look at the red bordered area, which cuts out uh, really the developed, uh, the, or the, uh, the undeveloped or less developed, the rural areas um, south of Rarit, and then cuts up all the way to the Borlaug attendance zone for this more rural area here. Um, it's a huge area. It does include 49 students. So there are 49 uh, resident students within that zone who would be impacted. So that's actually resident uh, pre-K-6 um, rather than uh, looking at secondary as well. But um, just wanted to show those. I'm more than happy to uh, answer any questions that you have about uh, my development of these, or if you want to look at them in, in particular, um, otherwise I'd turn it over to all of you. I just, so that little, I don't know, bow tie shaped spot has like 400 kids in it? That is, that is correct. Actually, in terms of pre-K-12, that little bow tie shaped area has about 1,000 students. All right. <laughs> Good luck with that, yes. <laughs> but I think that highlights 
right? The power of, you know, if you go back a couple maps and we see these tiny little cutouts and you're like, oh, well, what's the point? Like, oh, it's just, but, but if you, then you go to that tiny little bow tie and that, that highlights the power of these small areas and their ability once developed to really increase student population um, and, and change demographics in a way that um, we may not have anticipated when we put, you know, when, when we initially did the, the boundary zone. And so that, that's what intrigues me about, you know, can, it's just can we be smarter and um, make boundary decisions with more information once we know what type of development is going on rather than doing it now and guessing at will this contribute positively or negatively to our, our equity goals. And it seems like we can be smarter. It seems like there's opportunities here to untether ourselves from commitments that don't impact students, current students, um, and wait and see what type of development is going to go in there and, and be thoughtful, look at it, and then say, where does this development best, where, should, where do these students best fit to meet our goals? But that bow tie is, that's, that's pretty wild. That's very wild for that bow tie. My only question, I meant to ask this um, when we were on the other item, uh, can these maps be loaded in board docs just for transparency's sake? Um, people will listen to the meeting later and say, what the heck is he looking at? <laughs> so Yes, um, absolutely. Thank yep. you. question about the pieces of the puzzle by the way thank you for doing these um, my husband's also colorblind and it has interesting challenges doesn't <laughs> it um, when we are looking at um, certain areas like Weber and I think Alexander was one of your slides too yep. um, we also have to keep in mind that um, the FMP has two schools that might affect that as well so I just want to make sure that that's one of the moving puzzle pieces that we take into consideration when we're looking at those I don't know I don't know about the other areas you were looking at, if those could be affected by um, new schools, but um, those particularly will be. Mary Kate, that's a, uh, excuse me, Director Fletcher. I don't, I, uh, Mary Kate's uh, fine. Uh, or I'm Maka. fine with that. Uh, that's a great point. I, that's one of the bullets I think we could have added to the slide if Adam backs up or forwards to the pin slide. Mm -hmm. um, and Lisa, I guess this goes to your point too, is the district already owns property inside that kidney bean kind of shaped carve out there. And so it goes to that long-term perspective of, of when we would make these decisions. Um, because that purchase, I was sidebarring with Les, and Dwayne might know, was purchased at the same time or before we purchased the land for Liberty High School? They were talked about during Liberty High School, but lost the same development. So we've owned that piece of property inside that piece of land that we're now starting to see develop on for more than five years. Mm -hmm. And so to this conversation, and it goes, actually goes to some of the points you made in the previous conversation about not looking at today or tomorrow, but looking five, 10, 15 years down the road. And if Adam goes to the one at Weber with the bow tie shape, we've mm -hmm. had extensive conversations with the city of Iowa City. I know they're getting ready to release their plans about some of the work they're doing with the sewer coming on there for mm -hmm. development just south of that bow tie. And as we've shared, and right as you've kind of seen in FMP 2.0, some approaches that have been made to the district, nothing's been done about interest in that area. And so it really is um, looking, and it's hard to guess, looking at five, 10, 15 years in the future as we try to project maybe where those carve outs would be or would, if it's unassigned. But I think those are two important pieces to point out too, that even in one of those pieces that Adam showed, which I appreciate he did, the district's own property there yeah. and plans to build a school there in terms of the FMP. Um, in that ca in that little unincorporated zone, for yeah. unassigned zone, as, as Director Williams would. As we call looked it. at the um, redistricting for hundreds of hours, trying to make our um, schools more even, um, we realized how difficult it is. The puzzle pieces are so hard. There's a reason why this is so difficult, um, because you want it's a domino effect, right? So I just think. This is helpful as we're looking at what options are. Somehow we've got to make it so that it encompasses all of those considerations. Uh, not going to be easy to do. 
Um, and then we need the community to have noticed that catchment areas will change, right? I mean, we're building three new schools, I'm assuming, um, that will affect catchment areas. So that's just something that, you know, we have to be careful, and I've said it before about saying, well, but, you know, you're safe as long as we keep, um, like the memo said something about if we don't have hills, it's going to make catchment areas change. Catchment areas are going to change. I mean, they're changing. So the best we can do with like an exhaustive list of what will affect our catchment areas, the best we can do at um, predicting those changes over time, that's what we have to do for the students so that we don't end up with um, inequitable facilities and educational experiences. I don't know how to do it. I just know it's going to be really hard and we have to, you know, continue to do the work that you guys are doing to make sure those puzzle pieces are in everybody's mind on the board. Uh, <clears throat> Chase, I guess I'm, I have been presuming in, the, in looking at this uh, concept is that uh, <clears throat> the uh, ability to predict what's going to happen in the future is a lot easier after <clears throat> those areas, those small little areas, are zoned and platted. Because when the, the plats will tell us what density of housing type the developer intends to build there, and which will have uh, a direct impact upon FRL um, uh, ratios in whatever school that uh, area is assigned to. So I, I to me, this is uh, <coughs> this is a different way, and perhaps a much more efficient and effective way to uh, to even out FRL numbers in elementary schools. Um, and it, uh, I'm not too terribly worried about the future if we wait to the right point in the future to make our decision. I think you're right, Charlie. Or not think. I, I know you're right about after it's zoned and platted and, and in all honesty, one of these probably looks pretty familiar because I had Adam build it after a conversation we happened to have after a meeting last week where you just kind of mentioned to me about, hey, did you see that the city was, um, what they had, they had put out their plans for that area yeah, at, uh, at Scott and Rochester, right? And so that's, I don't know how long that's been, you know, sat there as farmland inside what is Lemmy, and then all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, obviously it's been in the works, but we don't really know, um, except for conversations ongoing with the city, and then when they do put it through zoning and planning of what that's going to look like. I think that also goes to a conversation about being good partners with the community development, which you talked about earlier, and you know the problem there is if we wait until after those announcements are made, how does that paint the district in terms of partnerships with the municipalities, um, developers, builders, and others in the community if they move forward under one set of assumptions being where a district is going to be zoned in terms of an attendance area because Adam you know, points out it isn't like these zones aren't already um, slotted to go to certain schools. I mean, this one is an example of the folks tonight would, would and I'm not, Again, this is all hypothetical. I don't want anybody listening thinking we're making this decision. But tonight, think that if you build a house there, buy a house there, you're going to Lemmy. But the discussion we're having is that, well, now that we know that we're developing there, we might wait and then assign that later. And so I think that goes to our responsibilities as being good partners in the community. And that's a small one. But if you look at what we talked about, the development on the southwest side, one of the conversations that Matt and um, Adam and the rest of the team and I have had is it can take a really, really long time for sometimes for a neighborhood to be built out. And so when do you make that decision? When there's only three students there or when there's 300? Because it could ebb and flow how that develops. And so it just goes into it's not impossible. I think there's just a lot of different things we would have to consider. And we would want to get community input, and then we would want to make sure that we gave notice to everyone that this is how we're going to look at it because of the ripple impacts that it could have across the community. Yeah. I, it, it seems, I, I don't want to get into a situation where, you know, we have 
this land zone for Lemmy, and then a developer comes in and plots it and, and gets that far down the process, and then we say, oh, well now we're gonna change, that, that seems like kind of pulling the rug out from under developers, and, and I, there's just a, it doesn't seem fair to me, and maybe I can't articulate why, but I think that they, they rely on this information when they're, they're looking at what can I sell the houses for, and, and how can I plot it, and what should I do? But that's why I like the idea of now saying we're not making a commitment, because then they, they don't have that data to rely on when making a decision about developing. And, and so there's no bait and switch or pulling the rug out because we've never, we just haven't said where it's gonna go. And I envision it working more in a partnership with them, saying, you know, what are your thoughts about what you would build? Well, if it looks like this, then this is, this is where we would like those children, you know, to the catchment area to be and, and have it be a, um, um, a collaborative process, I, I guess if that makes sense, but I'm a little uncomfortable with, with waiting until they've done all the work on the front end to then tell them where the kids are gonna go. I, I think that might be um, too little information to give them to be able to, to do their business. The, the reason why developers um, wanna know where the people are going to school is that's why people buy houses there. So a developer's gonna wanna know if they're in one of these no man's land places and they're developing, I mean, how do they market it? It's a no, it, we don't know where your kids are going to school. It depends on how much money you have. I mean, I just don't know how that's gonna work. I don't understand exactly what we're doing. Are, are we, what are we doing right now? Are we just talking about it? Okay, so yeah, my concern would be that developers are gonna scoff and say, one of the main things we do when we sell houses is tell people they get to go to school near where we're building. That's my concern. But, or Dwayne and, and Having been on the Planning Zoning Commission, I've heard many stories where developers have said this, and it didn't turn out that way, so. If I could, there's, there's a real relationship between cities, developers, and school districts. And just recently, Matt and Chase and I were in a city meeting talking about the Southwest development and the city planners are helping the developers lay that out. So there's all types of housing, all types of commercial, light commercial. Uh, but, but the thing that's driving it all, and Charlie, you and I have had this conversation, it's the sewer lines. And when the city makes a commitment to extend the sewer line underneath Interstate 380, that development will take off. And developers are working with the city right now. We're working with the developer on a potential school site. And same thing happened uh, up at Liberty High School. Liberty High School was actually built before Coralville extended the sewer up there. But because we built the school, we're building the school, Coralville extended that sewer line all the way up to that high school. Otherwise, we were going to put in a lagoon. I mean, it, that's how complicated those conversations got back then. But look what's happened since. The Scanlon Farms is going crazy right now because of all the little fingers that feed off those sewer lines and all the, the connector roadways that are going in. So it truly drives developments, but it, but it doesn't get done in a vacuum. Developers know what the city wants. We get to listen to those conversations. We get to stay ahead of that. That's why it's good planning now in Southwest and Southeast and even down South. I mean. If the city sewer wasn't there and they didn't have a sewer system or a water system, I don't think we'd be talking about a school in Hills. You know, we, we wouldn't be putting one on a septic system, but it's there. So that, that, I just want to point out that there's a real relationship between developers, cities, and school districts, and demographers, and all that information together is how you're gonna make the best decision. And then, Dwayne, I mean, do you, you, you've been doing this for decades. Do you think there's room, and, and you've heard, I think, me talk about this idea for a while. Do you think there's room for this collaboration as I envision it, or do you think that that, that, that wouldn't work? I, I, I'll tell you, in my previous district, I actually had meetings and brought developers in. We sat around a round table and talked about where, where developments were going to go around the city and where some parts of the city were going to be rehabbed and rebuilt. So yeah, there's, there's room for those discussions, sure. I, I think we can work together. I like the idea of meeting with the cities and the um, developers in light of what you said, that relationship. 
I mean, I think that would be really helpful to understand how viable this is. Yeah, I think it's really about finding the, the sweet spot, right? Uh, in the timing wise, right? If you get in there at the right time and say, look, right? Because the intent is to try and help, <laughs> you know, drive what building is happening where, right? In order to have mixed housing in different places, right? Instead of just, we build a school and then everything's all the same around it and you're locked into that's what your demographic is at that school, right? Um, so timing wise, if you get in there and say, hey, let's work together and figure out what this is gonna look like ahead of time, that'd be great, right? I think, yeah, when you do it after the fact, even if it's and I think there's flatted out, I think you can kind of get into trouble there. I'm concerned with like the example of the the little circle that was up there south of Liberty, right? Say, yeah, we already own land there. Well, pretty sure everything going around there is all gonna be the same, you know, cost level of housing, right? In that little bubble. It's actually, I, a, I don't, it's, 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 it's a pretty good development, it, I think. It, with there's several yeah. types. And there's, there's multifamily apartments. Yeah. There'll be okay. some condos and some single family. Well, my experience low. having lived up in North Liberty for 20 plus years is the Condos are just as expensive as everything else. Um, so saying that they have them does not necessarily mean that they have affordable housing. So that's still a concern of mine. But Well, I think a couple suggested next steps kind of listening to you guys talk would be, you know, reach out to some of our, our city managers, city partners, talk to them about this concept and this idea uh, to maybe get their feedback reaction to it. Um, I think the other thing that we'd probably want to be transparent with you guys about in the next iteration of the conversation is just how many of these locations are even out there. I don't think our volume on this is very large. Um, and so I think we'd want to, you walk in eyes wide open into that. I mean, Adam, you know, even to pull examples, grabbed existing student areas, right, that are already zoned to elementary schools that have students. So it's not like there's a whole lot of these areas sitting around the district. So I think probably a volume perspective and then also just getting some quick initial feedback from um, city managers, a couple of developers we have a good relationship with, and then bringing that back to the board to uh, discuss their reaction and you know your next steps after that point. Yeah, I you know I, I I think ever I really appreciate the conversation, and it is such a chicken and egg delicate. You know, finding that sweet spot is really difficult. I I think the most important thing is that we're involved in the conversations so that we are aware. Um, another important thing is just letting everybody know. For example, if you have a whole lot more people in the Penn attendance area, that attendance area has to change because the school's too full. And, and so I think, you know, as we move forward, thinking about the time we're spending on things, um, one thing that's more in our control than anything else is making sure every single one of our schools is amazing. And that no matter where people buy a house, despite their perceptions, we have an amazing school in every single school. And what's going to get us there? is high reliability schools, right? So that even within a school, every classroom is amazing. And I think that, you know, the time spent, that's where we're gonna get our bang for our buck, and then telling our story. Because right now, when people buy a house, the story they base, the school story is a, ter I mean, people are buying houses based on terrible information, right? Like they're actively buying houses based on really bad information that have nothing to do with reality. And so that's our job, I think, as a board and as a district, is tell that story. Tell the story of Hills with a high FRL that's our only blue ribbon school, right? Tell the story of, of you know, all of our schools across the district. And that's where we're gonna get bang for our buck because, you know, I can think, oh, I really hate islands and I don't wanna be, you know, all the boundary stuff. And it's very important to have those conversations. I do think it's less painful to rip the, having gone through the boundary discussion, I think it's less painful to rip a Band-Aid off and, and kind of have a big conversation than try, trying to micromanage all these little areas. Maybe not, you know, maybe that would be more efficient down the road, but considering that, you know, we have the most control over what happens in our buildings. And I just appreciate that and I appreciate what we're focused on because that, that's what I would like to walk away with no matter where your school is, no matter where you buy your house, you're guaranteed one of the best educations, certainly in the state of Iowa. That's, that's exactly why we care about FRL, though, because that is real. You can say we want all the best schools, all of our schools are the best, but the research shows that, that high FRL and other disproportionalities affect learning. So 
the fact that Hills was a blue ribbon school one year, I think it's wonderful. I read the application. It was beautiful, okay? But we had to be careful about setting that up because it might undermine our work toward equity. Because you can say all of our schools are beautiful, but some of our schools have disproportionate challenges because they have disproportionate populations of FRL. And that is what I'm trying to understand is, as we're looking at this procedurally or organizationally, do we have this idea under an umbrella of what? Is it in our um, efforts to promote um, more equitable schools? And we, I was involved in those conversations when we did this. I'm not even necessarily trying to use, I don't know if I'm using the right language, right? Are we talking about catchment areas that best serve our students? You know, like what is this under the umbrella? Because there's several, as we're talking about the pieces of the puzzle, this is one, right? So I think that, is this under the idea of equity? I thought that's why Director Williams brought it up, okay? So if we're talking about equity, um, Superintendent Degner, what you just mentioned is another important asterisk, like this might be a good idea, it might work. I'm glad we're in, you know, looking into it. How much impact would it have, right? And, and we have to be really careful to move the focus away from catchment areas are going to have to change because that's natural in a public school that grow, public um, school district that grows, and we care about equity. So we have to always be looking at that. It's not true that all schools are going to dominate if we don't care about equity and we're not looking at how to balance it. I mean, I would argue too. That research shows that um, low FRL school is not ideal. No, no, right? I, I didn't say that. That, that. Sorry, the research is there's a sweet spot. Right, right. I just think my point is people's perception is not that. People's perception is that low FRL is better because that's what the data would, that's what the, when you go to buy a house, that's what your score would indicate, yeah. essentially. You're right. There's and it, definitely and unfair assumptions made. So I'm not suggesting that, I'm not trying to negate what you said. I'm saying we have to be cautious about how we talk about this because I don't want to undermine the district's work toward equity. <laughs> All right, sounds like you do have some kind of next steps. I am kind of curious as to how much there is, right? I mean, I, I mean, we talked earlier about Southwest School, and then I see the little bow tie that is the vast majority of Weber, and I'm like, how's that going to help Weber, right? Because Weber needs help, and yeah. they're all crammed into one tiny little spot. And so I can see uh, Director Williams' point is maybe that tiny little spot that's up by Chimic or whatever, all of a sudden becomes that bow tie, and then we got another school that's in trouble, right? So I, I think the thinking around it is very valid. Just, there's just so many moving pieces. I think dominoes and puzzle pieces, all those things we've been saying are absolutely true, that it's it's a interesting approach to see if we can add that to all the tools that we use, right? So curious on the next data that we get. All right, should we move on? All right, our 21st century program. Uh, this is a follow-up uh, to some conversation uh, that we had <laughs> last meeting. Is jo I'll just say hi to Joan since she's sitting out there. So uh, I know I missed her last time she was here, um, but uh, you did approve on the consent agenda the grants for a 21st century program, and as we have schools rolling off, uh, from these grants, so uh, the district needed to create a plan about uh, what we do in those scenarios, right? Because it's been great to provide some opportunities for students, but we're receiving less funding from those now. Um, so I've asked uh, Laura and Kareen to talk to you a little bit tonight about that and probably some long-term questions for the district that, just to be honest, we don't have answered yet, uh, but that are some things that we are going to need to sort through. Um, and then I know there was some questions specific to Hills, too, that they'll address as they go through this. So. All right, thanks for starting this off, Matt. And we do want to acknowledge uh, last board meeting's community commenters. We appreciated them being here and kind of raising some awareness and some questions. And uh, what we're going to do tonight is provide an overview, um, a brief overview of the 21st Century Community Learning Center's programs and get to the heart of some of those questions that were asked and the issues that were raised um, last, last board meeting. And so, um, a couple of our key points are just going to build some common understanding around what extended day program actually is and what it means, how the 21st century programs fit within 
um, the range of extended day programming that we provide. And then um, just a little overview of the funding um, that is associated with all the programs. Um, I want to give some acknowledgement to Amy Clare, who isn't able to be here tonight. She had a pre-planned vacation. She is our extended day learning coordinator um, that oversees all of this and knows way more than I do about any of it. So I just want to make sure that we acknowledge the work that she's done and that Joan actually has done in the past as well. Um, Crean too, is taking over some of the oversight of this this year. So Les helps us with the financials. He can interject if someone asks me a question that I can't quite respond to. Um, and so we just want to make sure that we understand that all of our elementary schools have BASPs, have before and after school programs. Some of them, three of them currently, um, continue to receive the 21st century grant funding. So three out of all of those BASPs have specific services and supports funded through the 21st century grant. And as I go on, I'll talk about some changes and when that's gonna fade here for all of the schools. The reason or the issue that Hills came up is because this is the first year that they will no longer have those grant funds after having received them for the past five years. A couple tidbits about the funding structures are right there so that in all of our BASPs that are non 21st century sites, there's uh, funding streams through private pay. That's just parents and guardians just paying the rate for care. Um, child care assistance through DHS and then bridge care scholarships, which are scholarships that we use district save dollars to give access to um, students who would otherwise not, not be able to participate in the program. And then the funding structure of our 21st sites within those BASPs, of course, have some of those same um, funding streams, but they also have the grant funds, that's what's drying up over the next couple of years, and then the district save match. A Couple key terms are that our Community Education Advisory Committee for the district oversees um, a portion of the SAVE funding and establishes the priorities with the extended day um, being one of them and continuing to provide access. And then there's a definition of what SAVE is that I just put on there to make less happy. So um, <laughs> trying to lighten the mood here a little bit. Um, so then uh, for our extended day programs, um, this chart lays out the different programs that we have, and it's probably important for us to understand that there's actually four different entities that run all of these different before and after school programs. And so you can see, I don't need to uh, spell it out for you, but we've got the parent-run boards or neighborhood centers of Johnson County, Champions, and then Corval Parks and Rec. So all of that is what Part of Amy Clare's job is, is just to stay in contact with each of those entities, oversight of the programming services, and then specifically to the 21st Century Community Learning Center sites, oversee the tutoring, the, all of the services that are provided that I'll show you here in a slide in just a second. So a little historical context. By no means is this gonna give us all the details about 21st century programs over the um, 22 years um, that eight schools in our district have benefited from them. Um, it, serves, it serves maybe 300 to 400 students per year. Um, at each of the sites, this is be a school site, there's 30 scholarships, so 30 students don't have to pay to participate in the program. Um, there's three teachers that provide tutoring. They're certified teachers. The tutoring is in alignment with our district programming and academic planning, enrichment activities, transportation coordinator, you can see the other things that are a part of the grant funds and what we can provide. Um, this is just a real um, small summary, but the trend data shows a positive impact with the academic growth um, over the years, um, serving our students of color and um, supporting fam families report a welcoming environment. So there have been some changes recently with the future, which are the imp that will impact our future programming. So the private pay um, was something that changed about a year and a half ago, and it meant that um, we could no longer claim, we had to claim the 
um, private pay funds as income um, in our accounting. Bless, you can correct me if I'm not saying that correctly. And then also there were term limits where um, if you applied for a grant over time, the DE changed the regulations where after you had two grant fun funding time periods, which would be two five-year terms, you just can't apply anymore. And so that's why we're in a, the situation that because of those term limit changes, we're just not eligible any longer to even apply for the 21st grants. Um, so in the past, when we've had former sites, even before these term limits changed, you know, was a game changer, um, the, those, uh, when those grant funds faded out, those schools just continued to operate as a standard BASP. Um, so that is what we will continue to do as um, Hills is experiencing now. They had an RFP process last year and Champions is their provider for their BASP this year. Um, so some next steps in kind of thinking of sustainability and so what are we gonna do since we can't have the 21st grant funds? Um, we know they're eventually gonna run out. Um, we'll continue to use the saved funds that the district is making available for extended day learning. We'll allocate those to what we call bridge care scholarships, and those um, scholarships can be targeted at our higher FRL schools so that those schools have a few more than our lower FRL schools. And um, what we're planning to do next year in relation to Hills with this being the first year that they have not had um, the 21st grant funding and the ability to have used ESSER funds for the last um, two years, I believe it's been less. Um, we are able to help Hills continue to provide some transportation just for this year because of the availability of those ESSER funds um, and to increase their number of bridge care scholarship spots. And so, um, that really is because, as Les described it to us recently, I kind of think of him as like my personal financial planner. Like he was planning for um, the fact that you never know when you apply for a grant that you're not guaranteed that you'll be able to continue to receive it year after year. None of us knew that these term limits were going to be put into place, but Les kind of described it as you know, you never want to assume that you're going to continue to get those funds. So the save carryover helps us every year to kind of sustain the ability to at least do the bridge care scholarships from year to year and the ability to use ESSER in place of some of the save funds um, is really what's going to help us be able to provide a little bit of a bridge to Hills just for this year because of the ESSER fund availability. So what we'll continue to use um, those save funds for moving forward or prioritizing the top um, FRL schools, giving them, as I said, a few more bridge care scholarships scaled out over the other schools. And as schools do come off the grant, that will be Alexander, Kirkwood, and then Twain over the next couple of years, we will continue to allocate to them the bridge care um, scholarships for participation. We know that there's benefits of extended day programming, whether it's the 21st century or what other programs we have in place. We're gonna to continue to focus on increasing access to students who otherwise wouldn't be able to have a spot in the BASP. And we'll continue to monitor and explore other funding avenues. Maybe something will come along that we'll be able to rethink and uh, revamp and provide other types of services within our BASP. Um, but with the uh, fading of the funds and with the uh, what we have available to use for save um, we're thankful we can continue to pro provide the bridge care scholarships um, moving forward any questions the the thank you for this um, the bridge care scholarships are those pro or are those scholarships covering a spot at a BASP, or are we bringing in the three teachers and the academic support? Are they covering those costs? Bridge care is for non 21st century sites. So I guess my question is last year Hills had all this support. And, because and, they had the grant. Because they had the grant. Yeah. And, and also, I always mess it up, but it's, it's 
Alexander, Twain, and Kirkwood have this too. They have the grant funds currently. Yes, but the grants are gonna go away. Right. And we can't reapply. Right. So are we keeping the teacher and academic support at Hills and those schools, or, or we just don't have the capacity? We don't have the capacity to provide the tutoring, the transportation, the enrichment, kind of going back to what does the 21st century per site. These are the components that we won't be able to provide because that's what the 21st grant funded. So the bridge gap is funding seats at a, BA, at a traditional BASP. Yes. Are we requiring all of our BASPs to accept CCA? Have, have we done that yet? Um, all of them except um, the Corville Parks and Rec um, collects do CCA. Um, where do I have that here? So I guess the answer is no. So, so putting aside Coralville, I guess the bridge scholarships would we would give those for students who don't qualify for CCA. Yeah. It, so in in terms of looking at who has access to still you know no cost BASP, mm -hmm. individuals who qualify for CCA have access to it, and then in addition the bridge scholarship recipients. I mean, I'm assuming we're not giving bridge scholarships to students who would otherwise qualify. Correct. For they CCA. are targeted for low income okay. right. students and families. So uh, my good friend Les, then, <laughs> do we really not have enough money to continue supporting those students at the uh, Hills who were It would come at the expense of other programming. And as, a, as I shared with Laura in one of our meetings, is the 14 inch pizza, you can slice it into a thousand pieces or you can slice it into eight, right? But there's, it's not a bigger piece. You can't create a bigger piece of pizza just like we can't create a bigger budget right. to do these. So we, ha we have to figure out what that balance is between the resources available. Okay, can we? And we have rolled off some other schools already. Get, can to we this get grant. some uh, uh, small set of options for us? I mean, I was really, I'm really taken by the fact that there are a lot of uh, lower income families who go to Hills that are saying that they don't, they're not going to be able to use the BASP uh, advantage, <laughs> program advantage, uh, programming for them. That's their primary, their primary concern. I mean, I'm, that's why, right. yeah. yeah, they, I mean, the whole group sit around and talked about how there's only a certain number of scholarships and obviously there aren't enough. I mean, again, 67 kids are bused down to Hills, okay? And so they're really struggling with how to do this because they go to work, the parents go to work, right? And it's real hard to get <coughs> down to Hills and back mm -hmm. for a quick, break in, in, in their schedule, it's impossible. And so I think for me, it's, it's hard to understand how this works exactly. And this is good, don't get me wrong, it's just still hard for me to understand. Um, I think using Hills as an example, if, if there were a way to break it down so that I can understand how many kids then, like do we know how many qualify for that DHS? They, were, they referenced that as well um, last night. Um, and not enough do, and then there aren't enough scholarships. So I just, it'd be nice if we could break down those numbers a little bit, maybe have someone come talk um, to the group to explain it to them um, so that we can understand, we can identify exactly the problem we have, you know, in terms of numbers and what can be done about it. Because I had a hard time answering those questions yesterday. I would say also that I know the Hills one is front and center now, but we've had several other campuses this has happened to. And so we can't just look at a set of considerations for Hills. We would have to consider this at the other schools where this rolled off because those families all had challenges too. They all had plans that were disrupted and as they have rolled off those grants, they haven't been provided the same level of service from the district either. So it's not just a Hills solution, it's a, our probably, low SES building solution that we have to consider and think about what do we have the resources to do and what are the options there. I think what the teams put together is we really have the ability to scholarship 
said number of students, about four or five students, right, to do that. That doesn't feel good, that doesn't look good, um, used to the, or in comparison to the level of service they had been traditionally provided. So that's the only caution I could provide. We can continue to think about solutions, but it can't just be for the Hills community, right? We have other buildings that with those families, they would also love to have that before and after school service um, on a much more wide scale to, to help meet their needs too. So it, it's, a, it's a holistic solution we're gonna have to think about and I think that's kind of what Laura put on the end there that I don't think this will definitely be the last conversation with you guys because I also think it just creates some big questions for us about BASP providers uh, in general. We have different sets of rules um, that we're navigating, right? Just even Lisa's questions about child care assistance there about which ones accept and which ones don't. And so I think for the district it's just how do we take a holistic look at what our solution for before and after school care is going to be, knowing that obviously this, this issue's come to us here on the heels of another school rolling off of this, and um, we know other, that's gonna happen to others as well, so. I think you misunderstood me. I didn't mean that we should focus on Hills. I know you didn't. I, I was want, just okay. saying to everybody that if we look at this through the Hills lens, we're also gonna have to consider solutions for those other elementaries. I know that. Yeah, that, for yeah. me it was, you could choose any one of them, okay? any one of the schools, it's so that I can understand how it works with an example. I'm one of those people that learns when there's like actual numbers about a school. You can choose any one of the schools you want. I was just suggesting Hills because those are the people that I talked to last night about it. So I think it sometimes just helps if you can look at how it impacts a group of people, you know what I'm saying? And then I can understand why some get scholarships and some get the DHS um, CCA funding. I, otherwise, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around it. That's all I meant. I was actually responding to Charlie's question. We said, can we look at a set of options? And so the set of options is going to have to be considering all, all campuses affected, right? It can't just be the one that we're talking about now. Makes yeah. sense. I accept your correction. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but no, you, you, it's, it's, a, it's a very valid point, and we, I would like to have a district-wide you know, approach to uh, what, what, what do we do for funding these programs before the 21st century money was available? Could we not? How do we do that then? I don't know that any of us would have that history. We could but, probably ask Joan after the meeting what happened. She might have some of that history. But, did they um, exist? I'm not sure what, my guess would be they existed them. in very um, disparate ways, that some schools probably had great before and after school programs and some didn't have a before and after school program. That would be, you know, I think that's even what you would see in some other school districts, right? I mean, I do think we've probably provided a pretty low, high level of service okay. uh, in our before and after school program areas, but we could even try to find some more historical part of that, but it's just gonna be hard, because Les talked about our, how big our pie is, right? And what's our core mission, and again, that. That doesn't help families, that doesn't feel good, not trying to diminish any of that, but our core mission has to be what happens during the school day too. And then whatever other revenues we have that we can try to help solve those outside of school time frames, that's the resources we have to try to distribute through the organization. So um, could we talk about community partners? Can we continue to look at, again, like I said, our overall programming for before and after school? Sure, those are conversations we can engage in. It is gonna come down to a resource issue though for us. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thanks, Thanks, Laura. Anything else from directors on this topic? All right, we have one more discussion item. It's our P&G uh, committee meeting update. Basically, it's our device use <laughs> topic <laughs> update, more so than just P&G. I'll try and give a real high level update for folks. Um, I think the general consensus was we needed something much more consistent at the elementary level um, because there just wasn't anything super consistent at the elementary level. Um, there was some language in uh, a policy that uh, I believe the wording was something along the lines of, you know, kids can't use their phones according to the school's policies or they can use it according to the school's policies. And we talked about how we needed an and there, like an and district policy where the district would have a high level thing that is consistent across the board that everybody needed to follow, but it still allowed there to be um, the possibility of some flexibility at, at the secondary levels uh, to be responsive to the different schools and the different needs. Um, 
and now I'm failing on the rest of our conversation. So that's that's just because I'm going to give you right now. Uh, but there were most of the people here <laughs> were there, so I don't know if other folks want to weigh in on what uh, some of the other things. I think the most important piece. Um, during that discussion, P&G decided that uh, we were instructing administration uh, to develop SIP policy because we recognize school is in how many days? Um, and we need to get something in front of parents, uh, buildings, our staff, so they can um, sort of digest that policy and understand what we're going into the year with. And that policy would come back before P&G for us to uh, perhaps offer suggestions to strengthen it for the next school year. We wouldn't put something in place and then make a change and put it out uh, with the blessing of the board. So I think that. Yeah, and I think that that was what I was gonna add in to actually, Ruthina, because that was part of our purpose for the update tonight, just for people to understand kind of the direction from P&G was to go ahead with said sample policy. Uh, Eliza's been working directly with the elementary principals on trying to get their input feedback. I think they're responding well to, they're wanting to be consistent too, right, on, on how this issue is handled. And so we will have something in place uh, for, um, for August here that we'll start the year with. And then, yeah, we'll bring it back for conversation. And I think we'll have some anecdotal feedback too about what's worked well, what's not. And, um, it'll probably be the smartest way to write the policy, right? Because we'll have some experience with doing it and then we'll land in a good place at some point. I knew there was something I was forgetting. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> True. All right. Any questions? All right. I'm going to very slowly scroll on my screen while I wait for one of our directors to come back before we head into our action items. <laughs> oh, yeah. do, uh, we, do we need a motion to have discussion? No. I, I have some more. I, I have some questions about the FMP in general that didn't. Well, yeah, I think I think we're going to have some more discussion anyway because there's other stuff on here that we need to address. So, um, yeah, I think we can go ahead and start uh, the conversation. I know mm -hmm. uh, West is on there and maybe a couple other things. So I don't know who wants to highlight some of the changes. Yeah, we'll have, uh, I know Chase is going to talk a little bit about it. Um, I kind of already highlighted the two um, significant things that are provided in the memo. Uh, you have an updated timeline there. Um, and so I, it sounds like from some other directors there might be some clarification points too. So Chase will go ahead and open it for us. Good evening again. I will try to be quick. Um, really the two major changes or modifications on the, on the timeline are the West Secure Entrance, which we've had some conversation with, with the board, and then also the change regarding the, the timeline for, for Hills that, we, that we've talked about. Um, two other small pieces, we made a correction in terms of the placement of um, Garner Elementary. Um, I think that's something that was already in our timeline, we just had it misplaced on the timeline. Some additional funding for a gem edition at Lucas. Things again that were already captured in what we had planned to do. We just, as a review of the timeline, we hadn't seen those. If you have questions about those specifically, Dwayne uh, can address those. But um, to give a little more context to West, remember that our conversation was that this is part of the project at West is to redo that front area, including the commons and adding a secure entrance. But given the timeline, uh, we didn't feel comfortable with the lag in, before we added that secure entrance. And so um, adding a smaller project ahead of that larger project to um, expedite that secure entrance that we do believe is a good investment because it will simply become a secondary front entrance for the building once the full project is completed. Uh, in our earlier conversation, and this is more just logistics uh, for something we're going to try to do as we go forward, and Mary Kate brought up in the memo that we said in the memo that we said this was a living document. And so we'd like to make sure that we can keep the sequence going as we have these conversations. So as we bring these timelines to you, um, we are going to start naming them. So while it is FMP 2.0, the one we approved in, in, in April was FMP Timeline 2.0. This is now Timeline 2.1. So we can consider to see that iteration just a way for us to keep track of that as we track these changes along. It's not a typo, it, it was intentional to do that. But um, beyond that, um, we'll open it up to questions um, from the board. Um, my, mine's just real quick then. So can we um, then assume, since it hasn't been tweaked, that everything from 2021 and where we are in 2022 is generally on schedule? 
Yeah, we have yes. uh, 15 projects going right right now, either in design or started. So, uh, uh, so it's accurate. We're good. Yes. And then, um, are we are we going to be able to do 47 million dollars of work in 2024? Is that are sure. we going to be okay? Well, the majority yeah. of that That's is sure, so. yeah. The majority <laughs> of that is in the middle school projects. So you know, those are three pretty hefty projects. So. That's, it, we'll be able to do that. Okay. And, and the projects that you were referring to in 21-22, Corville Central, new entrance, you know, Garner's getting a new entrance. These are not huge projects that we've got started. We have some large projects in design, City High and West High. Uh, so those are coming up. But there, there, is a, there is a lot of projects started in the mix in 23 and 24. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through. I'm trying to figure out uh, when I'm looking at the, the the West High one that we've talked about. I'm trying to figure out from my little chart here, like how am I finding the like the piece of it that's okay. So if you go about a third of the way down the page is West High. The wing entrance, project. The front entrance. The front oh. is that's a Pebble project. That's not okay. Part of this. So we've pulled oh, it out of being part of because it's a its own little separate thing yeah and the actual front entrance is still part of yes this yes, project. you're correct yep gotcha right. sorry i thought you wanted to talk about all my pretty colors i do like all the pretty <laughs> colors you know there there are some projects that we we've, we've pushed way to the back or to the end and primarily the elementary schools with with the sixth grades opening up those are less of a priority at the moment, and the middle schools are the priority, so I think it's fair to say that we did that. Uh, I had a nice conversation with Les, and he can jump in here. We've all been jumping on Les tonight to, to back us up, but we talked about what happens in, after 2029, you know? I mean, we're looking ahead a little bit, but I'm thinking FMP 3.0. And in the good news, and correct me if I'm wrong, Les, is that the general obligation bonds are going to be paid off in 2029, and that the sales tax goes through 2045. There's going to be two to three hundred million dollars available for projects that we may not get done in 2.1 or in 2.0. So we have to think about that. You know, just keeping the ball rolling in the future and using the infrastructure funds the best way possible. Are you trying to extend your contract? No, man. I was going to say, he's already spending money in 2030, guys. Jeez. <laughs> in, in 20, I told Adam tonight in 2029, I'm going to be 79 years old, and I'm not going to be sitting at this table. It'll be Adam's job. <laughs> when I see it. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. I didn't hear yeah, we're going to stuff them and put them in a corner. <laughs> right. uh, I don't know. I guess I'd throw it out don't. there. Are there any questions on... Well, if there's questions, we'll definitely take those. Mine was more of a, if there's not, the kind of, I think, the wrap-up thing, like Chase talked about, we do expect probably throughout this plan, knowing that there's some fluctuation with cost, also knowing some of the scale around now moving to a middle school model and some of the early things we projected on elementaries. I mean, we are going to come back, right, on different, different elements of this to you at different times when things change. Um, but like I had said, I think one of the initial conversations we were having around Hills this is our direction to move forward, right, until you tell us something different. So unless this is altered or changed by you, or we bring a suggested change and you alter, we really proceed with the plan as is. And so I also would just want to make that clarification that we have a solid understanding of what's in front of us and what the team is working on behind the scenes according to this timeline. So we're really kind of taking it as the, the direction from you all to that we're okay to go ahead with these. So. So just to clarify, Hills, we did push that back for a 2024 start, which would be in an ideal world would be done by the fall of 25. But if we do any site development down there, it might push a little bit into the school year because it's really tough to get the site developed and build a new building in that time period. But the, the good thing is that, you know, we put the architects off for a year and so that we can work this out and get it in the right schedule. So you do have time to talk about things that are going to happen at Hills. They're all good things I heard tonight. All right. 
guess I, I would start by entertaining a motion. I move that we approve the updated FMP 2.0, 2.1, 2.1, there we go. I'll Sorry. second. All right, and then any further conversation on it? Again, the only reason I'll be voting against it is because I wanted more time on the Hills decision. Anyone else? All right, Kim, I think we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. That's my bad, that's my bad. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with directors Clausen, Malone, Istone, Eastham, and Williams voting yay and director Pilcher Hayek voting nay. All right, thank you. Uh, next up, we have our director liaison report. Anything directors would like to highlight from those? No. Going, going, okay. Uh, agenda setting, uh, we have a board meeting in a couple weeks. Uh, you can see the draft there. It's mostly the basics. We do have an equity update on there. I don't know if there was something specific we were going to cover on that, Matt, or it's kind of a placeholder. The equity update? Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll be bumping that to the um, the first meeting of the month since that's with the, with the way we started here in August. So we probably won't be doing that at the second August meeting. I do like the fact that it is the first day of school on our next board meeting. There will be one more thing on the agenda that well, we're going to talk about here in a second. Uh, but are there other things that uh, directors need to see on there? Um, I, and I, I might be missing it. So are we going to have any um, update about health and safety just because we're starting another school year and we've got monkeypox and I don't personally have monkeypox. <laughs> we have to think about monkeypox and uh, COVID. Yeah. Yeah, I put in um, your email today um, just to let everybody else know. We will send we'll send a letter um, prior to the start of the school year. A communication we've worked on that communication. I'm ready to go. We're just going to push out at the beginning of next week in regards to health and safety. And then, so we had to give some direction to staff, right? And we were, didn't have an agenda for tonight. But I do think it'd be good on the 23rd for us to just basically maybe reiterate the points in that letter. Talk about the first day. Um, you know, we're at welcoming staff back to. Uh, professional development opportunities that include more people than we have in the last two years and some of those things. So I do think it'd be good for us to touch base on it and just know uh, what's going on. So I'm not sure it needs to be a recurring one like we've always done or that we need to commit to that yet, but I do think for the first day that would make a lot of sense. Yeah, I think a reiteration of like, you know, volunteers in the school policies, that, you know, the, the, where yep. all that stuff lies, right? Because we've, you know, it's been a few months, right? So, well, yeah, and I, I months. actually don't know what the, the, um, plan will be and I'm not sure you guys necessarily know and so I just it, the more information we can give that we have from the Johnson County Department of Health or something yep. might be helpful I know the community will be looking at us right for the information and the only other thing I was going to say is with the agenda I get a lot of questions about what's that what's that going to be um, and I ask those questions too and I know we get a Google document from Superintendent Degner explaining some of it but I just think it, to be aware that I think sometimes our agenda items are very vague and, and the community doesn't necessarily know what, what, they, what they mean. So just having that in mind as we draft our agendas and to include um, the documents we'll be reviewing that the public will be seeing to the extent possible so that we have those in front of our face balls too before, before the meeting. Faces, not face balls. I just really like that you said face balls. That makes me happy. Super long meeting. Um, I don't know if we have to do it at, at this August 23rd meeting, but a parking lot item has been um, some things around the care assessment. Uh, I personally wouldn't mind with just Uvalde a couple of months ago and going into a new school year to kind of get an update on care assessment and um, how that works and, and how it interplays with our online um, monitoring software and, and just kind of a refresher and an update on on where we are on all of those things agree and as president Istone pointed out um, 
recognition of retiring board member who decides to abandon <laughs> the group. I don't know if you want to title it that way, but I'm okay with that. Seems fair. So wait, is next if the next meeting is his last one? Okay, so yeah, I will need some time to, to get some roasting materials together. So yes, that needs to go to the agenda. Anything else? <laughs> All right. So if we're mean enough to you, will you not resign? <laughs> <laughs> Keep it up, I might walk right out the door right now. <laughs> uh, I guess we can go ahead and move on. Uh, <laughs> I think we got our agenda pretty well set. Um, just to be pretty transparent as the item, last couple items here on our agenda just says board officer resignation. Um, I have, I'm kind of putting my money where my mouth is to a certain degree. Um, I've, I'm a big proponent of being a lifelong learner. Um, that's a skill that we try and instill in all of our students. Um, and after several years of putting it off, I am starting classes as a very old man uh, this fall. And it just happens to be that uh, half of my classes are on Tuesday nights from 6 to 8.30. Um, that makes being on this board pretty much impossible. So the next meeting in August will be my last meeting on the board. Um, and tonight I am actually resigning my president role just to try and have a smooth transition so I can be around for at least a couple weeks to help, you know, what all the logistics that we have to do is transferring power such as it is. Um, I will certainly have a wonderful speech that will make everybody laughing and crying in two weeks. Uh, I don't have that tonight, so that's all you're going to get. So as my last official act as a board president, I need to entertain a motion to cede the floor to our secretary so she can take over. So I move that we turn over our meeting to board secretary, Cam Colvin. Second. All, right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Good. <laughs> All right, as secretary of the Board of Education, I will preside over the election of school board president. Please remember nominations are not motions, so there is no second required for a director to be nominated. If you are nominated to office, please verbally respond if you are willing to accept the nomination. Once the nomination has been accepted, it would be appropriate for the director making the nomination to provide affirmative comments at, on why the nomination is being made. It would be inappropriate for other directors or the board as a whole to discuss or debate the merits of directors who have been placed in nomination. That is what the vote is for. The floor is now open to receive nominations for the Office of School Board President. Kim, I would like to nominate Director Malone for the Office of President. I accept. And for the rest of the board, I'm making this nomination because I think uh, Ruthina is clearly the most qualified among us to be the president of the board, drawing upon your experience as vice president and your long and your uh, second elected term, I think, is that right? Uh, and the um, comprehens comprehensiveness and um, fairness that you brought to all of your decision making, in my view, as a vice president. Hey, hearing no other nominations, the floor is closed to nominations for school board president. We will now proceed with the vote. You have a yellow ballot for board president at your seat. Please complete the ballot and pass it over to me. If one individual receives a majority vote, I guess we don't need to say that. We only want one person up. So if you just want to fill out your ballot and pass it this way, it'd be great. We have Director Malone voting for Director Malone. We have Director Clausen voting for Director Malone. We have Director Eastum voting for Director Malone. We have Director Pilcher Hayek voting for Director Malone. Lisa Williams voting for Director Malone. And Director Eystone voting for Director Malone. Director Malone has been duly elected to the Office of School Board President. I will now administer the oath of office upon the President. President of the Board, 
Do you solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Iowa, and that you will faithfully and partially, to the best of your ability, discharge the duties of the school board president in the Iowa City Community School District, Iowa City, Iowa, as now or hereafter required by law? I will. Congratulations. Thank you. We will now use the same process to vote for a school board vice president. The floor is now open to receive nominations for the office of school board vice president. Kim, I will nominate Director Williams for, for school board vice president. I accept. So Lisa, I'll try to say complimentary things. <laughs> wow. It must be hard, Charlie. <laughs> Dig deep, Charlie. Dig I deep. guess I guess that was not the best way to start off, <laughs> but you do bring a, tre a tremendous uh, uh, capability and uh, 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 industriousness to your uh, to your work here. I was really impressed with your work on getting uh, uh, the uh, uh, preschool programs uh, put together. So I think uh, I think you'd make a great vice president. Thank you, Charlie. Hearing no other nominations, the floor is closed to nominations for school board vice president. You have a blue ballot for board vice president at your seat. Please complete the ballot and pass it to me. We have Director Clausen voting for Director Williams, Director Malone voting for Director Williams, Director Eyestone voting for Director Williams, Director Easton voting for Director Williams, Director Pilcher Hayek voting for Director Williams, and Director Williams voting for Director Williams. Director Williams has been duly elected to the Office of School Board Vice President. I will now administer the oath of office upon the Vice President. Vice President of the Board. Do you solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Iowa, and that you will faithfully and impartially, to the best of your ability, discharge the duties of school board vice president in the Iowa City Community School District, Iowa City, Iowa, as now or hereafter required by law? I do. Congratulations. <laughs> and the new officers will now assume their elected duties. Thank you, Kim. Um, with that, and that being our last piece of business, I move for a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Don't want me to do it.